morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Good morning, doctor. Good, good to see all of you here. Yeah, yes. Good to see you too. Sorry. Okay, so the meeting is streaming on Facebook. Right, so maybe we can start with a prayer. So may I, may I request uh, Reverend Ian to, yeah. to say a short prayer? Let us pray. Good morning, Father. We are here. All your children gathered together in your name, Lord. You know our purpose and we believe that it is not our will, but your will that we are here to learn from your word and discuss from your word, Lord. So please bless us, touch our brain and touch our mind that we can concentrate and understand the deepest things of your word. I submit our teachers unto your hand. Father, you bless them and help them that they may enable us to understand the deepest thing what you have put in their mind, Lord. Father, you also bless us together that this meeting became a great blessing for us and all those who are participating. I submit all of us into your hand, Lord. Bless us together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all and welcome to this conference. I hope uh, a lot of you a lot of uh, the participants will be joining eventually. So we have uh, our faculty and students from CITS, also from Kolkata, Ayan, and a few uh, golden from Mumbai. Uh, so we'll start with the moral argument. And we have with us Professor Kwan, Professor Kai Man Kwan from Hong Kong Baptist University. He's a senior professor over there and director of the Center for Sino-Christian Studies. So, so great to have you, sir. And it's over to you. Please take the time. You'll be sharing for uh, 40 minutes uh, along with me, and then we'll have a QA session uh, for 20 minutes after that. Over to you, Professor Kwan. Okay, uh, can you, okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Uh, not yet. Okay, I think it should be coming. Okay. It, uh, my computer is a bit a bit slow, so okay. It takes time. Uh, but, uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very glad to uh, to have discussions with the brothers and sisters in India again, and uh, we hope that uh, through uh, discussing and thinking about these problems, uh, our faith can be deepened, and we can also be more equipped to think. Now, can you can you can you hear me, see me, and see the PowerPoint? Can you see me, see see the PowerPoint now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Can, can do that. Look now. I'm going to talk about uh, <clears throat> the moral argument. A uh, moral argument is a kind of uh, theistic argument or argument for God's existence by starting from some moral experience or some uh, moral data. Now, the theme today for this conference is theology, the problem of evil. Maybe I explain a little bit why uh, we need, why, why it is appropriate to talk about the moral argument when we address the, the problem of evil. Now it is because the problem of evil uh, is a kind of argument against God. It, it is the atheist claim that the data about evil seems to be incompatible with the existence of God, or somehow they are evidence against uh, God's existence. Now, uh, we have talked about this problem uh, be before in, in, the, uh, in the earlier apologetics conference, but uh, and then uh, my colleagues are going to talk about more 
the Christian understanding of various aspects of evil. Now, but uh, the relevance of the moral argument is that if there is evil, there is also good. So if the problem of evil is a problem for feast, then the problem of good may also be a problem for atheist, because uh, when, when you say that there are objective evil, it means that there are objective moral considerations or objective moral standards, which make something uh, good or evil. Now, uh, if we can further argue that the existence of this kind of moral objectivity is more likely to be explained or can be better explained by God. And then uh, these kind of objective moral standards would be very difficult to understand or explain in, a, in, a, in an atheistic universe. Then we can also say that uh, the, the general phenomena about morality uh, will also count for God. Now, so even if the problem of evil cannot be uh, entirely dissolved, then if this moral argument is convincing, then uh, we can, from the data of morality, find an argument to balance the problem of evil. So I think uh, apart from the apologetic purpose, uh, the moral argument can be used uh, to address the problem of evil in this way. Uh, but first of all, uh, there are many types of moral argument. Now, for example, there is a famous Kantian moral argument. Many people, uh, if you study philosophy, remember Kant as a, a, a kind of a philosopher who denies natural theology. He criticizes the cosmological argument, uh, the theological argument, etc. Uh, uh, but uh, many people forget that, in fact, Kant also argues for God. He thinks that we cannot start from the data of the universe. Of course, I, I do not agree with Kant here, but Kant also thinks that we can start with the phenomena about morality and then argue to the existence of God. And that is because morality requires <clears throat> a kind of highest good or summon bumnum, which um, means that the happiness should be proportioned to virtue. It means that goods should be rewarded, uh, the really good people should be happy in the end, and the evil people uh, should suffer or should be miserable in the end. But if the world is uh, like the atheists talk about it, uh, our lives and the world uh, will finish after our death, uh, we will have no uh, longer any experience after our death, then from the data of his human history, we can see that this is not true. A lot of good people uh, have been miserable and a lot of evil people have prospered and enjoyed their life without pain and punishment. Now, so in an atheist world, this moral ideal of happiness being proportioned to virtue cannot exist. And then Kant uh, uses a further analysis to show that only if there is immortality and only if there is a God who can control both the moral law and also the natural laws can achieve this kind of harmony. Now, so our moral ideal would request, would require the existence of God. So that is one kind of moral argument. Uh, but uh, I have no, <clears throat> no time to talk about it uh, today. Uh, and then I'll, I'll focus on this kind of uh, argument, which is a moral argument from the objectivity of the moral law. Now, there are several premises for this argument. Objective moral law exists, and they can't exist unless they have a basis in reality. Okay? Uh, only God's mind can be the basis of moral laws. Neither the material world nor social conventions can provide a basis. Therefore, God exists. Now, if we believe that uh, there is something objectively wrong, for example, torturing innocent people or killing a lot of young kids uh, for no reason at all uh, is wrong, or if you believe that uh, Hitler uh, massacring a lot of Jews and uh, Polish people, etc., is an evil person, a mother Teresa, who helps a lot of people uh, unconditionally, 
is a better person, at least a better person than Hina, then you believe that there are objective distinctions in reality, not only in your mind. We believe that even if somebody thinks that Hida is a better person than, than Jurisa, we will say his judgment is wrong. It's not true that Hina is a better person than Mother Jurisa. Now, so uh, if there are such standards which are independent of our opinion, then it means that objective moral laws exist. Now, but of course, there are more relativists who would want to deny the existence of objective moral laws, I'll come to that and defend the premise A here. Now, but uh, if there are some moral laws, they, if they have reality, then they, they must be real uh, in terms of uh, reality. That is, you, you have to provide a basis in, more, in, in the reality for the objective moral laws. Otherwise, if it depends just on the taste of people, or it depends on just some contingent historical facts, then they are relative and they cannot be objective. Now, I'll, I'll argue later on that, in fact, uh, we cannot provide a convincing or satisfactory explanations of the objective existence of moral laws apart from the mind of God. Uh, so that means that we have to believe that God exists if we believe that objective moral laws exist. Now, uh, that can be further more experience, uh, more arguments. For example, we can argue from more, uh, more experiences, but uh, the shortage of time uh, forbids me to go on here. And I'll now elaborate the argument from the objectivity of the moral law. Okay. Now, uh, first of all, the structure of this argument uh, the one premise is the uh, assertion that some moral standards are objective and correct. Now, uh, mind you, uh, for this argument to go to, uh, to proceed, we only need to believe that some moral standards are objective. Now, of course, some alleged moral standards may be subjective. Uh, some standards uh, may be relative to some historical uh, circumstances, but uh, we believe that our moral standards are not entirely uh, like this. At least there are some basic values. For example, cruelty is bad, uh, benevolence is good, so on and so forth. Killing an innocent people is wrong. Okay, now, so we only believe that there are some moral standards. Now, to deny that, you have to be a complete uh, moral relativist or nihilist, that is, you have to say that all moral standards are subjective, and then that is very costly, and that is quite contrary to our moral experiences and also our moral practices, and, uh, and also the practices of law and society, etc. Now, and then basically, uh, I would say that if there are more objective moral standards, then either we give a naturalistic explanation, that is, we appeal to facts about the natural or material world uh, to explain the existence of uh, objective moral laws. Uh, but if naturalistic explanations are not satisfactory, then we can try religious explanations. Now, religious explanations may include theistic explanations or non-theistic explanations. Now, for example, in Chinese culture, some believe in a kind of Tao or Tao, which is a kind of eternal principle, which contains some moral standards. Now, uh, but some Chinese scholars do not believe that the Chinese Tao is a personal God. Now, similarly, in the Indian traditions, some, some people believe in the, the law of karma. They think that the law of karma will uh, punish people according to their uh, moral virtues or vices, and they are objective and they exist. And uh, if you are not punished in this uh, life, then you will be punished uh, in your end of life, in your reincarnation. Now, concerning this uh, problem, I, I, I will leave Dominic to, to talk about it. So mainly, I will, for my part, I will try to argue that if there are more objective moral uh, standards, then natural explanations are not good at all. So we have to appeal to some religious explanations. And of course, the existence of God the moral laws, 
based uh, on God's uh, loving and uh, uh, benevolent nature and so on, can explain uh, clearly the origin of moral laws and the objectivity of moral laws and also how the moral laws can be used to judge people and punish people if there are some evil person violating the moral laws. Okay. Uh, and then uh, if the naturalist explanations are not good and the feast explanation is good, then uh, the, the feast explanation should be deemed the correct truth. And then if we argue further that uh, the non theistic explanation among the religions is not as good as a feast explanation, then we can say that theism or the existence of God is the best explanation of objective moral laws. So, so then that arrives at our conclusion of the moral argument. Now, uh, I would, uh, due to shortage of time, I will skip some slides. Now, I'll go directly to the evaluation of premise A, which is about the objectivity of uh, morals. But first of all, uh, some people would not grant premise A to defeat the moral argument. Some naturalists or some atheists are ready to deny the objectivity of moral. So they go the way of moral relativism or nihilism. And they think that they are reasonable because they think there are some good arguments for relativism. And usually uh, the, uh, the popular arguments for relativism are several. First uh, is the argument for moral diversity. Uh, they, they point out that the moral judgments are widely di divergent in different uh, societies. And they think that since people uh, have different ideas about the moral judgments. So the moral standards must be relative. So that is the argument from moral diversity. And secondly, uh, there's an argument for tolerance. They think that if you believe in objective morals, objective good and objective evil, then you would impose your ideas of good and evil on other people, and that would lead to intolerance. Uh, so uh, that is their understanding of uh, moral uh, objectivism, but intolerance is bad. So if uh, moral objectivism leads to such a bad result, then we have to reject uh, moral objectivism. So moral relativism has to be true. So that is the second argument for moral relativism, and that is the argument from the uh, tolerance. And then there are the, the third argument, the argument from moral dilemmas, they think that no moral rule is absolute because it always leads to moral dilemmas. Lie both ethics, white lies. For example, if you think that killing is absolutely wrong, but sometimes uh, in the case of a war, you have to defend your family and country, then you may be forced to kill people. And maybe the moral rule has to be broken in some moral dilemma. So they think that there are no uh, objective moral rules, so moral objectivism is false. So these are the three main arguments for moral relativism. Now, of course, the topic is big. Uh, into uh, in uh, this morning's talk, I can only scratch the surface, just intro introduce you to this argument, and you can follow up this topic uh, in more books. Now, but I think uh, this uh, these three arguments against moral objectivity are not very good. Now, because the existence of diversity in terms of human opinions does not entail the, the uh, relativity of the standards. Now, for example, uh, whether there exists extraterrestrial life, ETs, is a controversial question. Some scientists deny the existence of ETs and others believe uh, in ETs due to say UFOs, etc. we have also covered this uh, well, uh, some people have said uh, there was a previous talk about UFOs, etc. Now, but anyway, uh, although reasonable people may disagree over the existence of ETs, but you can recognize that the existence of ET itself is an objective question. Either there exists some extraterrestrial intelligence or uh, there isn't any. So even if human opinions uh, diverge, it does not mean that there is no objective answer. Now, so 
we need to distinguish descriptive relativism and normative relativism. Descriptive relativism means that if we just use the sociological method to describe the moral standards in different uh, cultures, they may differ a, a lot. Now, but that does not mean that the standards have to differ uh, among themselves. Now, if there are some conflict, it is still very possible that uh, some, uh, some size may be wrong and the other side may be uh, 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 correct. Now, so the existence of direct opinions in itself does not show that the standards are, are relative. I think there is a, a kind of a misunderstanding uh, of the nature of this disagreement. Now, uh, and then the, there, and then in fact, if we look at uh, many uh, major civilizations and many societies, although there are some moral standards which vary a lot, we can also see that in fact, uh, there is also the, a lot of consensus uh, about the major values uh, or the major moral principles, say killing innocent people is wrong, uh, love your family members is good, so and so forth, say in India, in China, or in the West. Now, so I think uh, the divergence of moral opinions in itself has been exaggerated. And then the second argument, I can only deal with it very briefly. This argument for relativism is just confusing because if you say that uh, moral objectivism leading to uh, intolerance, so moral objectivism has to be rejected. This argument already presupposes that tolerance is an objective value. Otherwise, there's no reason to do so. Now, so to argue against moral objectivism, this argument already presupposes the objective value of tolerance. So this argument itself is a self-contradiction. So there's no reason to accept such a self-contradictory argument. Now, and then the existence of moral dilemmas themselves uh, can be dealt with uh, by having the idea of uh, prima facie duty. Now, although killing, uh, the, the prohibition of killing may not be absolute, but the only exceptions are when you have other moral commands, for example, to defend your country and family. So that's why sometimes killing in a just war is justifiable or acceptable. Now, so if we say that you just kill people for fun, you do not uh, want to save your country, you, you just kill people because you are happy. You feel happy about that. Is any sane mind uh, saying that killing people just for fun or torturing people just for fun is correct? Now, so even if uh, there are more dilemmas, we can still describe many moral situations when we can see that some moral judgment exists. So that is enough for the existence of objective uh, moral standards. Now, uh, so uh, you know, in a way, we can use uh, other all other things equal cross to express the idea of the moral objectivity. For example, caterers, paribus, all other things being equal, it is morally better not to murder than to murder. I think uh, there there would, would not be many people who would disagree with that. Caterers, paribus, it is morally better not to lie than to lie. Now, so although there may not be absolute uh, moral rules, it does not mean that there are no objective moral judgment. Uh, many people have confused the two things. Now and then, uh, so if the arguments for moral relativism is not cogent, then are, are there good reasons to uh, reject moral relativism? I think there is, because in our practice, and in fact, I think by appeal to our moral intuitions, when the we look at our lives, rarely can we find a person who can really refrain from all moral judgments. Okay, now so moral relativism is hardly a livable option. And then in fact, uh, in our lives, uh, uh, we have strong moral intuitions like uh, to, to murder innocent people just for fun is wrong, uh, so on and so forth. Now, if you want to deny all these moral intuitions, I think uh, it is reasonable to, to deny, uh, def depend on our intuitions. I do not think there is any reason to reject that. And it is this kind of moral beliefs 
are so, uh, I think, uh, uh, grounded in our history and our life that I think unless you have good reasons to reject them, it is much more reasonable to accept at least there are some such moral uh, judgment than to deny them. Okay, now, uh, now and then I go on to, 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 to discuss if there are more objective moral standards, uh, as the premise A says, then can we provide good naturalistic explanations about that? Now, as I have said, to explain some objective things, you have to ground it in the reality. Now, so for the uh, lecturist, uh, if they want to explain moral objectivity, they can only appeal to uh, their reality, which may include A, non-human nature, B, human individuals other than emotions of reason, C, human society. Now, but it will be difficult for non-human nature to provide objective uh, foundation for morality, uh, because as a naturalist conceives the natural world, the world consists of, say, atoms and electrons, quarks, uh, more electric fields, magnetic fields, etc. Now, uh, in, the, in the formulas describing all these forces and matter, there may be uh, considerations of space, distance, velocity, uh, uh, etc. But there's no good or bad. These objective things are not moved by moral considerations uh, according to the naturalist. So it would be very difficult to, to say that uh, uh, we can find objective moral standards in this non-human nature. Many, now I can only cut a long story short, some, philosoph some philosophers have tried to argue otherwise by giving a very sophisticated analysis of good in terms of say, uh, benefits to human beings, etc. But uh, I do not think any such attempts really succeed. Uh, so the planets uh, go around uh, the, the sun according to the law of gravitation, regardless whether it is good or bad for, for human beings or for other uh, uh, life, etc. If we use imitation of nature as a funda fundamental moral principle, then should we imitate a high degree of cooperation with the ants, community, or the survival of the fittest principle prevailing in the jungle? Now, because, uh, for example, the, the Taoists uh, say that uh, we should imitate nature, but nature is ambiguous morally. Uh, or we can see that uh, there are uh, some species, like ants, uh, which cooperate with one another. They seem to love one another. Uh, but uh, there are also the spiders, uh, which devour their partners after the mating. So if we imitate, uh, which shall we imitate? So when, when we decide to imitate the cooperating ends, we are already presupposing some moral standards. And the sociobiology tries to show that human beings have moral standards because the existence of moral standards would be beneficial to the survival of the human species. Now, but that is uh, taking a, a different problem. The sociobiology or, uh, or the evolutionary psychology uh, may explain, I do not think they have very good explanations, but they may explain why most uh, beliefs exist in human society. But if the existence of moral standards is just a kind of tool to promote human survival in some historical circumstances, then these uh, moral standards may become outdated and they cannot be objective across time and space. Now, so in fact, if morality just exists for human survival, then if a human individual find it very inconvenient for his survival, then if it is reasonable in this sense, then he may also reject moral standards. There is no objective reason why a human individual has to respect the moral law if he can see through it. Because moral standards just exist. It's a kind of biological adaptation. They come to exist because they help humans survive. But I find moral standards inconvenient for my survival. So 
For the same reason, I can also reject uh, moral standards. Now, so in fact, uh, uh, there uh, Michael Ruth, a kind of evolutionary uh, naturalist, he says morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Now, now, but if that is uh, so, uh, then the objective, object, objectivity or moral standards is a kind of illusion. It helps the society survive, but Ruth is candid about this. He says, I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they're referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reverence is truly without foundation. Michael Ruth, an evolutionist, says so. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction and any deeper meaning is illusory. So that is a logical consequence of a naturalist will, which depends on evolutionary psychology or similar arguments. Now, if you argue, argue that objective moral standards are dependent on human individuals, then it is very difficult to explain why it is objective. Because if you say human reason will prove Moral standards, uh, I will tell you, uh, this is very difficult. Uh, and you may prove moral standards are useful in some circumstances, but it is very difficult to prove that uh, they can be objective uh, regardless of individual taste or circumstances. Now, and then if you rely on the human emotions, for example, David Hume, they, they, uh, he thinks that uh, morality is founded in human sympathy. But of course, many people have sympathy for, the, for some victims, etc. But still, there are also many individuals who are callous, cruel, or even sad, sadistic. There are serial killers who can feel nothing. So I, I produced some news in Hong Kong and, and in China, maybe, uh, which talks about many real cases, like this uh, pathological uh, sociopath serial killer. OK, but I, I think. Uh, Every society has these people. And in fact, most people, although they are democratic, like in some circumstances, they can also be violent. Uh, they can also be abusive. Now, so uh, there is uh, no, no uh, solid foundation in human nature to grant the objective requirements of morality. OK. Uh, now, so. I think uh, there is a still there's some naturalists try to appeal to a social contract theory. They think that uh, objective moral standards result from a kind of agreement uh, between people. They they seem to uh, having a contract with one another. Uh, this contract is like this. So some A and B sit down around a table and say, okay, now if we fight uh, one another endlessly then that would be detrimental to both of us. So let us agree to some uh, shared moral standards. Let us uh, help one another, let us not be violent towards one another, so on and so forth. This would be good for us. Now, so uh, the social contract theory argued that it is rational for all the people in the society to make a social contract, to follow moral rules, because uh, reciprocity, I helping you, you helping me, would be best for everyone. Now, so in this sense, they say morality is objective. Now, but there are five major reasons <clears throat> why this kind of social contract theory cannot really convincingly explain morality. Now, because this kind of uh, social contract theory presupposes that there is human cooperation, but if, and then if everyone follows morality, then to be moral, we would, would be beneficial to your, yourself. So uh, being concerned about your own self, uh, welfare, it is rational to obey morality. Now, but uh, in many real cases, there, uh, the society is immoral. There are a lot of cruelties, corruption, bribery, etc. In such a society, to, to have integrity, uh, to be moral would be very costly. Now, so this kind of uh, presupposition does not really obtain in many uh, societies. So this social contract theory cannot be applied to this, uh, this kind of society, which is quite a uh, widespread. And then there's a second problem of the 
free rider, uh, if the majority of people in a society are following morality conscientiously, one can gain maximum benefits by violating the moral demands when not likely to be detected and punished. This is a free rider. So everyone is moral and then you can be sticky. You, you can cheat other people when they, they cannot detect that. But so you still appear to others to be very moral, but you can uh, take advantage of others whenever possible. So there is a moral free rider. And according to this reasoning of social contract, this free rider is in fact quite reasonable to do so because to agree on a, a social contract from the very beginning, just to protect yourself, if you can protect yourself as well as gaining a lot of advantage, that would be a, a, a reasonable option to do. But of course, that is against morality. But the social contract theory would justify the free riders. So that is uh, a mistake for the social contract theory. And then uh, the social contract theory also presupposes that uh, uh, people need to be reciprocal. But if in some circumstances, there are some strong people, there are some tyrants like uh, Mao Zedong, uh, who possesses so much power that it does not need to look at the responses of other people. So in that case, there is no uh, reason for Mao Zedong or Stalin to make a social contract with other people. They can just abuse their power to kill other people, uh, to strengthen their, their tyranny, so on and so forth. But this uh, consequence is not really moral, but that is a consequence if the reasoning of the social contract theory is correct. Now, and then uh, we also see that morality requires us to help people who cannot reciprocate, like the poor, like the animals, but the social contract depends on reciprocity. So the social contract theory cannot explain all these moral demands. And lastly, social contract uh, theory depends on the balance of interest. But if, moral, uh, if the existence of morality is helpful, but I think that is not enough to justify to sacrifice our life. But we can see that in human history, morality, in fact, requires many people to sacrifice their life just to help out other people for their family, uh, like a fireman uh, or sacrificing uh, for, for the uh, potential victims in a building, in a, in a fire, etc. So uh, the social culture theory will not justify all these uh, really low moral demands. Now, so I think I'll stop here. Uh, uh, the, the point is that uh, objective moral standards exist. That is a more reasonable conclusion. And then naturalistic theories cannot really explain the existence of moral standards. But what about some non-theistic, non-personal religious explanations? I'll leave it to Dominic. Thank you very much, Dr. Kwan, Professor Kwan, for sharing with us. Yeah, he has presented various uh, views and objections to the, yeah. to the notion of uh, moral objectivity, and he has countered them very successfully. As you can see, Dr. Kaiman Kwan was presenting, and he, if, if most of you know, Richard Swinburne, right? He, yeah, so, uh, to, Professor Kwan studied under him, and now he's the director of the Center for Sino Christian Studies. Right. So I, I know that you have got a lot of questions popping on your mind. Uh, you can type them down. If you have those questions, you can type them down in the chat box, or you can open up your microphone and ask. Uh, after I talk about the moral argument in the karmic context. So let me talk about this now. Right. So. Uh, here is a rule which looks very common in any society. You go to any society anywhere in the world, you'll find whatever deed he does, that he will reap. That's from the Brihad Aranyaka Upanishad. And the Bible, a man reaps what he sows. Jaise karni, vaise bharni, you know, in Hindi, what you do is what you get. 
So this is regarded as a kind of, of an absolute law in karmic religions. Now, I will very quickly give you an overview of uh, the various uh, philosophical systems that are built on the very notion of karmic. Now, when I say karmic, what do, what do I mean? I mean a belief in morality without the need for God, you know, that sort of a framework which we find in Indian religions, especially most of the sects in Hinduism and Jainism and Buddhism. Uh, so the, 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 there is a discontinuity between the Christian view or you can say the Western view of morality as an absolute and the karmic view in the Christianity, moral law is interpersonal, right? So it is something that uh, is between people, okay? So in the karmic view, karma, the law of karma is impersonal. It is just a law of causality. It has nothing to do with personality or consciousness or anything. It's just a normal law. It's just an impersonal law out there. Uh, Christianity, God is a moral lawgiver. There is God who gives law, who gives commands, okay? Uh, but in the karmic view, karma itself is amoral and mechanical. There is no God who particularly gives law. Even if there is certain, a certain God in some, some sects that gives some sort of law, he's also under the law of karma. So for them, Ultimately, karma is amoral. It has nothing to do with morality. It is not a moral law. It's just a law of causality. God is the moral judge in the Christian view. In, in, in the karmic view, karma needs no judge. Of course, some would say, well, Yama, the God of death, has a book of records and he judges and so on. But he's also part of the cosmic system. He's not over it. Okay, He's not the real. He also can get judged. All right. So the fourth one, God is the moral morally perfect one there is none good but god he is the embodiment of perfection moral perfection and the source of per or all morality in uh, hinduism especially they talk about nirguna brahman and saguna brahman i think you know about that uh, but but it's not necessarily accepted that god is all good i met him i met a professor on train once we had a discussion i said what what is your explanation for evil in the world and he said well if you find evil in the world and good in the world, it means it should also be in the source, right? <laughs> so, so if there is something out, it should also be in the source. Nothing comes out of nothing. Something comes out of something. So God is all good, also all evil. Uh, some of you may be studying uh, Carl Jung, and he had a similar notion of Satan being one of the uh, uh, personality within the, of course, he didn't say trinity, he said quaternity. So evil is part of God. That's the notion. Christianity, God is the ground of morality, while in the karmic, even gods are subject to karma. Everyone is subject to karma. Nobody can escape the, the, the hold of karma. So these are some discontinuities that we find between Christianity and... The, so how do we argue about the about God and morality, you know, if we talk about God as all good in a, in a context, like a karmic context, we need to keep all of these things in our mind. Now, very quickly, let me give you an overview of the Indian systems. We have uh, the six Hindu systems, Sankhya, Yoga, Vedanta, Mimamsika, Nyaya, and Vaisheshika. So Sankhya, Yoga are one, just a little bit of difference. Sankhya is absolutely atheistic. It even has so many arguments that God does not exist. It went head on against uh, Nyaya a theist arguing that God cannot exist. It's impossible for God to exist. There is no proof for God and there is no need of God in this universe. Now, you may be, you may be wondering how can these be religious? You know, religious philosophies when they don't believe, it, absolutely don't believe in God. But that, that is very true of karmic system because they believe this is some sort of a law. It's not really moral. It's just a law and this is sufficient to rule the world. So Sankhya is something like that. It is atheistic dualism. Yoga is also, in, it, it tries to show itself as being theistic, but that God is your own self. You know, your own self is God. So this is a kind of self, a kind of dimension of your personality that is a God. So it's just you objectified in a way. So that's 
what I would call it as subjective theistic dualism, not at all similar to the Christian concept of God as the transcendent holy other, all right, who creates the world out of nothing. Vedanta, we all know about that non-dualism. So, you know, only God exists and I am God, Aham Brahmasmi. Mimamsa, it is pluralistic, not uh, dualistic or monistic. It's pluralistic, but at the same time, it is very, very, very strongly atheistic. They have these, these strong arguments that God cannot exist. Some of you might be wondering that atheism is built into the system while people don't even know. They think that, well, in popular religion, you don't find it. But when you go to the philosophical basis, ground of it is absolutely atheistic. And that's what we are trying to unravel. Nyaya and Vaisheshika, especially Nyaya, the epistemological uh, uh, you know, genius uh, that you find in Gautam Maharshi and all of these people who came up with all of these arguments, syllogisms, Indian syllogisms and all, they, they were very strong into logic. Nyaya itself means logic. Okay? And they offered, later on, Udaya uh, Yana, they offered some arguments for the existence of God around maybe 7th century AD. They offered a number of arguments for the existence of God, mainly because the Sankhya were arguing against them and the Buddhist and the Jains were trying to come up with many arguments to prove that God does not exist. So Nyaya, they felt it important to prove that God exists. And so they came up with cosmological arguments, argument from sustenance and argument from also the belief in Veda because uh, the six schools of Indian philosophy are known as, in a way as a, uh, uh, as uh, as what what you call that astic not nastic astic the believers because they believed in veda so we'll look into their arguments shortly and then i will try to show why even the nyaya argument is not sufficient uh, to to give us a concept of a true concept of morality and god now these are blatantly atheistic all right buddhist Jainis and Charvaka, they absolutely have no place for God at all. So we don't talk about them. Uh, but uh, of course, we, we had, even if uh, I say Professor Kwan, he needs uh, our cover of life. And, uh, yeah, these, these arguments, we can cover them all, but I think these will at least uh, 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 prod us to bring up some questions that we can discuss during the QA hour. Okay, so the Nyaya concept of God, God is the efficient cause of the universe, not the material cause. That's very different from the Vedanta. In Vedanta, God is the material cause. God, the universe is made up of God, all right? In Nyaya, no, the God is the efficient. He uses pre-existent material like the Platonic God, you know, he uses pre-existing material, mainly because in any sort of rational theologies, whatever you go anywhere across the world, it's very difficult to come up with this notion of creating something out of nothing. Something cannot come out of nothing. So you don't find a cre creatio ex nihilo in, uh, in any Indian system. Okay, so God is the efficient cause. He is not the material cause, but he uses pre-existing material. Secondly, God is perfect in majesty, glory, beauty, power. These are the six attributes of God in Nyaya concept. God is the director of human action and ensurer of fruit of actions. So there is a need for God to be there for any sort of conscious things to happen in the world and even for something like a personal moral law to function. That is a strong argument of the Nyaya. Uh, philosophers. And fourthly, God is the moral governor of all beings, and uh, in a way, he, he helps karma function properly. So he's not about karma in a way, but he helps karma function. He meets out justice in a way uh, that we, people can get it. So kind of an administrator or manager rather than a real judge. Number five, God is not bound by the law of karma. So that is a Nyaya concept. Okay, let's look at the arguments. Now, I talk about Nyaya giving nine arguments for the existence of God. And we'll look at the seventh argument and the ninth argument. The seventh argument from Vakyat. Vakyat means word. Now, all Hindu philosophical systems believed in the Veda. And if you believe in Veda, the Veda contain moral commands. Of course, the 
the form in which the Vakyat argument is given, it doesn't mention moral, but that is how interpreters put it. Vedas contain moral commandments or any commandments which are considered to be word, eternal word. Now, these are, intel these are intelligent words, all right? They, they are not nonsensical. They make sense. If they make sense, they are intelligent. And if they are intelligent, they can only be issued by an intelligent uh, being. And they are moral commands, then they should that can only be issued by a morally excellent being. Therefore, God is the author of the moral commands. That's the Nyaya uh, argument. Now, we, for those people like the Jains or anyone who doesn't believe in Vedas, the argument would still hold because if you concede that there is some sort of moral objectivity there, if you can see some sort of moral objectivity there, then this argument holds for that because moral objectivity is impossible without a morally excellent being as a source of it. And so God is the author of, of moral commands as such. Uh, well, morally objective rules can be put in intelligent sentences, right? Statements, they become statements, moral statements. So that's, that's, that's how you trace the, the source of the commands or the statements. Uh, the ninth argument, adrishta, which cannot be seen. Now, you'll find this notion very, very, very common among people who say, well, why is this good man? He's such a good man, but he's suffering. He's such a, he has not done anything. Or this baby is born like this. What did the baby do? You know, in the Bible, you find someone asking the question, uh, this man is born blind. Why is it? Was it because of his sins or his parents' sins or someone's sins? Yeah. Sort of hinting to his past life, if you look at it from the Hindu perspective. Did he do something wrong in his previous birth? Some of the Jews believed in uh, reincarnation as well. Did you believe, did, you know, he has done something in his past life. That's the reason why he's suffering like that. So that is something which, uh, which uh, Nyaya tries to use it. Now, it's Arguing from the context, please remember, it always argues in a framework which is accepted as a kind of a uh, axiom for people uh, in, in that context. So people usually say, well, he's suffering because of something that he may have done earlier, or this is a bad man, but he did not experience, he gets, he escapes or he gets out anyway, maybe because he might have done something good in the past. Now, here is a catch, you know, when you talk about karma in in the whole karmic notion it's impossible to rationally talk about forgiveness good deeds will not cancel out bad deeds all right and bad deeds don't they they are separate from each other you know the causal relations are very separate so adrishtat is something related to that and nyaya argued that adrishtat by itself when you talk about this adrishtat or fortune or unseen fortune it is by itself unintelligent now, if it is unintelligent, then uh, it's impossible for the mechanism to meet out something which is uh, related to moral intelligence. And so uh, the, the conclusion that they gave is since more for, now this is in the bracket, it's my, my, my input into that. <laughs> I'm reading into the text. Since moral action is intentional, produced by desire and volition, Okay, and the Nyaya also argued that this desire and volition is put into humans by God, all right, because they can't just do it by themselves. So, you know, something in the previous birth, now you're having this desire, it should be put by God. And so it needs the guidance of a supremely intelligent God. Well, if uh, those, of, those who reject the Vedas and those who reject any of those things would even say, well, if they believe in some sort of moral consequences, if you do something wrong, then you reap it. If they even believe in something like this, whatever deed he does, that he will reap, or man reaps what he sows, in, more, in the moral context, not just uh, uh, physical context, but moral context, then uh, the, the entailment would be that that entails divine existence. That do, uh, entails divine existence. Even here, it entails a moral governor who kind of an orchestrates all of these things to happen in a way. Uh, Well, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing if we are <laughs> going overboard the time. But uh, yeah, so these are some of the problems that you'll find. And uh, uh, Nyaya, the Nyaya God, 
of course, is not at all similar to the biblical God. We have talked about that. There are certain problems that we see, and some of these problems are question, can moral action be mechanically regulated? Now, this is, this is not just a new question. You, people are talking that when they are talking about artificial intelligence, you know, can moral action be mechanically regulated? You know, we, can we do away with these codes of justice and all? Is there anything absolutely good or evil? So, uh, but the big question that people usually ask it from where did this karma, law of karma even come into being? So there are a lot of issues with this. And uh, uh, the main, main problem is the mechanical or impersonal world that, that uh, is envisioned here, it contradicts consciousness, intelligence, personality, rationality, and evolution. Therefore, uh, therefore, therefore, you cannot talk about a moral world at all. And so the more rational conclusion would be the Jain logical conclusion where you just become passive because you can't do anything. You just become passive, don't do anything. And so that passive embracement of suffering would be the final resort for salvation from the whole chain of karma and samsara in, in any karmic context. So, you know, the philosophers kept arguing about that, but I wanted to just give you a quick note so that you can do your further research. You know, I, I've, never, I've never seen anyone, any, any article talk about Nyaya moral arguments. So if anyone of you is, are interested, you can work on that. So, okay, so did I share my screen by, by the way? Were you able to see my screen? Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, we should have Q and A, but I think we took, uh, yeah, we have, a, uh, we have a question here. Uh, after taking a few questions, we'll take a break, okay? And then we'll have Dr. Andrew Loke present to us. Uh, we'll take a few questions and then we'll take a break. Uh, Karthik has a question. Ba some couple of questions regarding theodicy. By what criteria something is judged to be evil? Number one. By what criteria is something judged to be evil? And number two, is natural evil too rooted in the wrong use of our free will? And Professor Kwan, would you like to answer? Now, uh, the question is, by what criteria we judge something to be evil? Now, uh, there are different uh, sy systems of ethics by talking about the uh, uh, the the standard uh, for for, ju for judging uh, the things. Now I think uh, one common option is utilitarianism, uh, but I think utilitarianism means that uh, the criterion is that what uh, promotes the maximum happiness of the maximum number of people would be correct. But I think uh, utilitarianism is incorrect, uh, uh, and because uh, sometimes uh, killing or uh, condemning an innocent person uh, may promote the, the maximum happiness of the maximum number of people, but this is unjust, this is unfair to that innocent person. Now, so uh, for me, uh, the best moral systems uh, is a kind of, uh, what is the, the William Wars intuitionism. In fact, uh, it is a revision of Kant's deontology. Deontology means that there are some moral commands, say don't kill, don't lie, don't commit adultery, which are absolute standards. And, and these standards are, are plural. They are not uh, just one single criterion. But, but the problem with deontology is that uh, these uh, moral com commands can come into conflict. Now, so uh, William Voss has a a uh, brilliant idea, which is that each moral command is objective as long as it is not overridden by high moral command. So we don't we, we should not kill people unless say we we have to say defend uh, uh, the invasion of our country by some uh, some people who has no reason to invade our country, so on and so forth. Now, so in fact, I have already expressed that in the PowerPoint. So. Caterus Paribus said, without 
other countervailing moral considerations. It is always is wrong to kill people. It is wrong to lie. In fact, I abide by most uh, common sense morality, which is endorsed by the Bible and major traditions. And so my idea is that if there are no countervailing considerations, something is just killing, you are just lying, you are deceiving others just for fun. These are always wrong. So uh, this is a kind of some. Sometimes people call it intuitionism, because uh, the the ultimate this is uh, rules of uh, action, uh, something which makes an act uh, prima facie wrong. It's not proved by science or experiments, but they can be perceived by our heart, a kind of uh, Chinese would call it conscience. Uh, and uh, sometimes the philosophers talk about moral intuitions. So this is my idea about uh, the criteria for judging evil and good. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Kwan. Uh, another question by Giri. Uh, Giri, do you believe in reincarnation? Minute. Uh, let me first, uh, by Giri, do Jews believe in reincarnation? Yeah, some of them, the Kabbalah, they think that you cannot uh, experience everything in this one life. And so they, some, some of them believe in this sort of uh, reincarnation. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> nice to see you. Okay, so yeah, uh, J Dr. Jayakumar, you were asking some question. So you were asking some question. Okay. No. Anyone else has any other question? Right. If uh, no question, we can take a five-minute break. And after the break, five-minute break, we'll have uh, Dr. Andrew Loke from Hong Kong Baptist University. He will talk about evil before the fall of Adam, evil in the world before the fall of Adam. And we look at his perspective as well. Thank you and see you in five minutes. See you all in five minutes.
Nice to see you, Ashish. Okay, welcome back again. We have with us Dr. Andrew Luke, Associate Professor in the Department of Religion and Philosophy at Baptist University. And uh, he has written a number of books, including a recent book on the problem of evil and the Kalam cosmological argument. And uh, in the last conference, he presented on, uh, on, on resurrection. So probably some of you have read the book, which is open access, it is available. Anyone can download it and read it. So over to Dr. Andrew Luke, who is also the chairman of Hong Kong Center for Christian Apologetics. Over to you. All right, thank you so much, Dominique. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. It's very good to see all of you again, especially uh, during this uh, COVID pandemic. Um, so uh, today we are gonna talk about something related to that, right? The problem of evil uh, and suffering, which a lot, of world, uh, a lot of people in the world is going through now. And this uh, talk, which I'm gonna give is a follow-up to our previous conference. So if you remember, in the previous conference, we spoke on the Kalam cosmological argument, which demonstrates that there is a creator of the universe, right? There's a first cause, uh, a divine first cause, which brought the universe into existence. So there is a God. And we also talk about the argument for this, that this God is a designer. This, this God created the universe, designed the universe. And he also raised Jesus from the dead. And so this is the foundation for thinking that Christianity is true. Right, that we have hope of eternal life, right? So, uh, because Jesus rose from the dead, and you know, that shows that He's God and He's able to give us eternal life. And we also talked about the problem of evil in our previous conference. And during that conference, quite a number of you raised questions related uh, to the problem of evil uh, in your uh, comments and follow up and feedback to the conference. And one of the one of the questions that that were asked is. Regarding the natural calamities, what could be the difference between the pre-fall nature and the post-fall nature, right? So are, are we going to believe that, you know, that there, there is evil and suffering all along um, in the natural world, even before Adam's sin, right? So how, how, how are we going to think about that? You know, did that come from a divine first cause? Now, did, so did, did the evil also come from God? Now, we know that that is not the case because you know, um, the Bible tells us that God created the world, but God did not create evil. Rather, God created angels and human beings, and angels and human beings have free will, and they are the ones who disobeyed God and brought evil into existence, right? So that is the traditional Christian view. So uh, if that's the case, then well, how about, what, about, what about animal suffering, right? Is, uh, before Adam's sin, how, how, how do we think about that? And so that is the question which I'm going to address today. And one, uh, somebody also give the feedback that you know, please suggest some books on arguments related to creation. And so I'm going to begin by suggesting a book. And this is a book called Reading Genesis Well by an Old Testament scholar con called John Collins. No, he is, he's, a, he's a great Old Testament scholar. And he, in this book, he teaches us how to understand Genesis, which is very important for uh, our Christian doctrine of creation. Right? How do we understand creation? And so if, you want to understand, if you, so if you want to understand Genesis well, you should read this book. Now in this book, John Collins explained that Genesis 1.1 describes the initial bringing into existence of all things, right? So the Kalam cosmological argument shows that there's a first cause, a God, and this God created the universe ex nihilo, right? And Genesis 1.1 talks about that too, right? Genesis 1.1 says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? God brought about everything, uh, the whole cosmos at the beginning. And then verse two, gives the condition under which the first day began. So verse, verse two is related to verse three, when it talks about uh, the first day. And the Bible does not exclude a gap between verse one and verse two, okay? Now, some of you may have heard of the gap theory, right? Now, um, some, in, in the past, people try to argue that you know, the, the, there are some Hebrew words uh, which may imply a gap. However, other Old Testament scholars think that, well, you know, it is not proven because those, those words can have different meanings. Now, John Collins argues that even if it's not proven that there's a gap, 
nevertheless, the Bible does not exclude a gap. So there could there could still be a gap, even you know, so th this possibility is not excluded. So there could be a gap between verse one and verse two. And then the six days are analogical, right? So um, they are not strictly twenty four hour days, but they they are is analogous, right, to uh, a twenty four hour days, but not necessarily strictly equivalent. And the key here is to look at day seven, right? Uh, if you look at day seven. Uh, you you'll find that you know, that there's no mentioning of morning or evening, right? Evening, evening or morning. There's no mention of evening or morning. And then other passages in the Bible seems to indicate that God still remain in the state of still, still remain in, in, in rest, right? In Psalm 95, for example. Uh, so this Im implies uh, that the seventh day is more than 24 hours. So if the seventh day is more than 24 hours, the first six days can be more than 24 hours too. And so this implies that the, 20, the, the day is not. You know, shouldn't be interpreted as a strict 24 hour day, rather, they are analogous right, to a 24 hour day, analogous to a, a, a work day. So, this is God's work day, right? And so, um, and the six days, um, analogous days, are God's activity of shaping the material of the earth to provide a super place for mankind to live, to love, and to serve. So, this in a nutshell is how we can understand Genesis chapter one. And the implication of this is that Genesis does not imply that the universe was created in six 24 hours days. The Bible actually does not say, say that. It doesn't imply that. And therefore, this is compatible with an old, you know, um, old Earth creationism, right? It is compatible with you know, the, you know, that the universe could have a long history, um, much longer than just uh, you know, a, a few thousand years or, or whatever, right? It, it could extend way before that. And there could be dinosaurs and other things, right? Uh, before human beings came along. So, so this is an important uh, implication, right? Uh, we need to understand when we try to understand the Bible, right? We should try to understand. We 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 can see that there is actually no conflict between what the Bible says and what science tells us about the age of the universe. Okay, uh, but some people will ask a question. Okay, so if you if you say that well, there are, there are millions of years before human beings and there are dinosaurs uh, and other animals, but those dinosaurs went extinct, right? So those dinosaurs died. Uh, and other animals, also, many, many animals also died before human beings. So how are, how are you going to account for the animal death and suffering before the fall of human beings? And this is a question that many atheists would ask as well. I mean, they, they, they say, why, why is the universe so wasteful? Why, why are there all these animal distinct, uh, extinctions? Why is, why is it so, so imperfect? And Christopher Pitchens, an atheist, says that 98% of the creatures went extinct, right? And you know, he, he no, he, I think he thinks that this is an argument uh, against God, right? He thinks that this is an argument from evil, uh, that, that there's, there's evil and suffering in the world, right? Uh, uh, before human beings, and, and, and you know, this, you know, he, he, he thinks that Christianity cannot account for that. So, so we're going to address this issue in the rest of the talk. And I would like to begin by asking a deeper question. So to, in order to answer this question, we need to ask a deeper question, which is why God created the universe and the living things in the first place. Now, the Bible tells us that the reason why God created these things is not because God needed anything, right? Acts chapter 17, verse 24, 25 tells us that God does not need anything, right? Because he's the first cause of the universe. He, he brought everything else into existence. God himself doesn't need or require anything. So uh, God does things for his own sake and glory, but he doesn't need anything from human beings. He doesn't need anything from, from creation. So God does things for his own sake and glory, not because he needed anything, but because he's the greatest good and the source of all goodness. So what, what the Bible is trying to say is that you know, God does things for his own sake. You know, it's, it's not, to, not, not because God needed anything, but to manifest his goodness, to manifest you know, his, his love and, 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 and his divine attributes. So God created the universe uh, is is an outflow, an overflow of his love, right? It's not because God, it's not because God needed anything, but because God is love and he wants to bless other creatures, including human beings. And he created and that's why he created human human humans. And Acts chapter 17 says that you know, God has given human beings life, breath, and all things, right? So God wants to bless us. So the reason why God created us. It's not because God needed anything, but it's because God wants to bless us. And when we receive the blessing, we give thanks to God, we give glory to God. And that's how God is glorified. 
And so um, God himself is the source of all goodness and God himself is the greatest good. And humans should live for the greatest good, which means that we should live our lives for God. And But what about God? Who, who does God live for? Well, obviously God can't live for something higher, right? Because God himself is the highest. And that's why God himself does things for the greatest good, which is himself. And that's what the, that's why the Bible says you know, God does things for his own sake. You know, that's how we should understand that, uh, that verse. And humans often does things for him, him, themselves out of selfishness and neglect of others. But whereas God does things for himself, not out of selfishness, but you know, for his own sake, for, for his own perfect character of justice and love. And that is why when the Bible says God does things for himself, this actually you know, resulted in the care for humans because God is love, right? God wants to bless us. And so uh, he lead us in the path of righteousness for his name's sake, right? So God wants to bless us. And Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 says that after God created human beings, God blessed them. And God also wants humans to have dominion over the earth, right? To subdue the earth. So as to shape them as individuals and as they, as they make fr their free choices in the process, right? So God wants uh, um, to, people to develop you know, their, their relationship with him and with the rest of creation as they uh, do have dominion over the earth. And this process also allowed them to experience the grace and power of God as they work with God to have dominion over the earth, right? To serve God, uh, to choose to rely on God, to serve him and to glorify him. Now, we should note that um, what this means is that when the Bible says God created the universe, the universe is good, but good, very good doesn't mean perfect. Right, because there's still work to be done. Right, God wants human beings to subdue the earth, you know, to have dominion, means to, to govern the world. Right, it means that there's something to be done here. And as a scholar, uh, Alex, uh, Dennis Alexander, he, he pointed out, he says we should be very careful not to imagine the pre-fallen worlds as if it was already the new earth that God has planned for the redeemed, where there'll be no work, more death or suffering. This will be a kind of reverse eschatology. Instead, the present world was created as a good world, fit for God's plan and purposes. Looking forward to another good world to come which would be good in a different and a more complete sense. So God's command to, for, to human beings to subdue the earth in, uh, prompts a question, which is that if everything is already perfect, why, then why does it need subduing? Right? That you will not need it subduing, right? Sub subduing, right? It, is already, it was already perfect. So what this imp seems to imply is that you know, the, the world is actually not in a perfect state, right? When God tell Adam to subdue the world, the world before Adam was actually not in a perfect state. I'll explain this more right, as we go along. Now, some people may ask, what about Genesis chapter 1, verse 30? Right? Doesn't this imply that all animals were vegetarians? Right? Because God says you know, he gave uh, hu human beings and animals. God, God told Adam you know, that uh, uh, he has created, uh, give uh, green plants for food right, to Adam and also to the animals. So does it mean that all animals are vegetarians. Now, Genesis 1.30 may be referring only to creatures in the Garden of Eden rather than creatures on the entire globe. This is the first point, and I'll, I'll, elaborate, on, I'll elaborate on this point as, uh, later on. But here I want to bring out two points first, and I'll, I'll elaborate on both of them as we go along. Right? So, and so that's the first point. The second point is that Adam was placed in a divinely protected environment in Garden of Eden. And this Garden of Eden is not a global, uh, you know, it, it doesn't extend across the entire globe. Rather, it is a localized place in the Middle East, around the Middle East, right? It's a limited geographical area. You know, it's, it lies between four rivers, as the Genesis described it, the river Tigris, Euphrates, right? The four, four rivers are around Eden. And so Eden was a localized place on earth. And after Adam's sin, the ground on which he lived was cursed in the sense that it no longer had divine protection. Okay, so that's how we, we can understand Genesis 1 to 3. Now, let me elaborate on these two points. Now, on the first point, Gavin McGrath, uh, he's, he's another scholar, he pointed out that because the reference to the vegetarian animals is placed after the focus on creation of human beings in Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 30, 
rather than after the focus on animals in Genesis 1, chapter 20, uh, verses 20, 25, this lends itself to the interpretation that these vegetarian animals are those of in the human world, right? And the human world is the Eden and its environments rather than the whole planetary world. We need to understand that the Bible, were, uh, the biblical authors were Hebrews, and very often when they write, the, script, uh, the, the, the Hebrews were more concerned about function and feminology, how things appear to us, right? And that's why when you read the Psalms, for example, it says that you know, the, the sun right, is like a bridegroom, right? Coming out from one end of the earth to the other end. It doesn't, it, it's not actually telling us that the sun rotates around the earth, right? That's not what the Bible is trying to say. Rather, it's talking about appearance, right? The, the sun appears, right, to rise and set, even though you know, we know that literal, no, that's not true literally. Right? So the Bible is more concerned about how things appear, the feminology, the function and feminology. And we see here also in Genesis chapter 1, that is referring to how things appear to Adam right? in, his, in his world, in his, which is a limited place on earth, is within the Garden of Eden. So the animals in the Garden of Eden, they are vegetarians. But, it does, but this does not imply that there were no carnivores outside of Eden. Right? It doesn't imply that. And McGrath proposed that in the Garden of Eden, the lions were of a different nature compared to those outside the garden, which existed earlier, right? So even be so before human beings were created, there were already animals, there were already lions, and lions eat meat. But those in the Garden of Eden, they were vegetarians, they're of a different nature. Just as God can miraculously cause the lions in the future Messianic kingdom not to eat meat, we read this in, we, we read this in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 7, Right in the future, the lions will, will will not eat meat anymore. Right, they'll be with the lambs, and you know, they they will live in you know, with, with, in peace and harmony. God can also miraculously cause the lions in the original Garden of Eden to be vegetarians too. Right, God can do that in the future. God can do that in the past. McGrath explains that in the first Eden and its environments, death was unknown. It, within within the Garden of Eden, there was no death. Right, inside the garden, there's no death, and inside the garden, humans were vegetarians, and so were the animals. Likewise, in the second Eden, they, you know, it's the same thing. They shall, no hurt, not, they shall not hurt nor destroy all in, in all my holy mountain. Therefore, in both the first and the second Edens, the second Eden is, in, is the future Messianic kingdom, the, the lamb and the lion lay down together. For God also gave the animals in the first Eden and its environments the same nature they will have after the second coming of Jesus Christ. But this was not so outside the Garden of Eden and its environments, not, not outside the first Eden, right? So, Yes. So within the first Eden, within the, the Eden of Adam and Eve, there is, there is no carnivores, but this is not so outside the Garden of Eden. So in other words, there was already animal death outside the garden and before the garden was created, right, and before the fall, right, before the fall. So that is the implication of this interpretation. Now, this interpretation actually fits better with other biblical passages. So for example, in Psalm 104, it says that the young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God, right? So you, you read this in the Psalm, in Psalm 104, right? verses 21, 24, it says that the lions eat meat. And the Bible also, and that passage also say that this was created in wisdom by God. So God created lions originally to eat meat, right? So it is not that lions eat meat only after because human sin, right? That, that's a young earth creationist interpretation, right? So young earth creationists think that, well, originally lion also eat uh, vegetarians, uh, lions were also vegetarians, but because human beings sin, because of the curse of Genesis 3, lions started to eat meat, right? That, that's, that's how they interpret it. But actually the Bible never say that, right? The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that lions originally eat meat. Right? This was created in wisdom by God. It is not as a result of curse, right? It's not due to the curse. It's, it's, they were you know, is created as such by God, okay. So, um, so this is a clear teaching of the Bible, and this inter and this view is also um, and this interpretation also has a long history in Christian tradition, right? Um, so very often you will hear young creationists you know they will say that their interpretation is the traditional one, but actually it's not true, right? If you look at the, the historical theology, the history of interpretation. You'll find that Augustine and Aquinas, you know, they said this already you know, thousands of years ago. Right? Augustine, 1,500 years ago, Aquinas, a uh, few hundred years ago, right? And so, and this is before modern science. 
right? So this is this is a long time ago in, in the Christian tradition. Augustine and Aquinas, they did not they did not think that carnivores resulted from human sin. Rather, they thought that predation already existed before the human fall, right? So God created it this way, you know, because one animal is the nourishment for another, right? God created lions to eat meat, you know. So one animal serves as say, say, say so some animals serve as food for other animals. This is how God intended it to be originally. Okay, and Aquinas say similar things as well. He says that the nature of animals was not changed by man's sin. So Aquinas categorically deny the young of creationist interpretation, right? It's not due to human sin, but this is how it originally intended, created by God. And this is it, this fits better with the Bible in Psalm 104, as I explained. So you find this in the Bible, you find this in Aquinas, Augustine. Now, what about Romans chapter 5? Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says that uh, death comes through sin, right? But then if you read the context of Romans chapter 5, it's talking about human beings. So death to human beings begin as the consequence of Adam's sin, right? So this verse is not talking about you know, the entire uh, creation. It's, it's referring specifically to human death, right? Human death came because of human sin. And so that, that is uh, on the one hand, right? On the other hand, if you, the, the eating of green plants in Genesis chapter 130 indicates that there was already biological death, right? The death of plants, right? Prior to the sin of Adam. So, you know, so uh, the, the, the Bible is quite clear that there is already death, right? Even before Adam's sin, you know, what, uh, death to plants, right? Plants had to be eaten and when plants were eaten, of course, plants die, right? So Adam's so Romans chapter five is saying that Adam's sin resulted in physical and spiritual death uh, to humans, right? The late resulting in alienation from God. That's what he's trying to say. No, it's not denying that there are animal or plant death before human sin. Now, as I said earlier on, um, now a lot a lot of people would ask. Uh, no, as I said earlier on, the initial creation was very good, but this does not mean perfect. In fact, if you read the word. If you read the same words, very good in Hebrew, tov meot. Now, these words are not only used in Genesis chapter one; it's also used in Numbers chapter fourteen, verse seven. The same words, and this is used for the promised land that you know that God will bring the Israelites into. Now, is the land is the land perfect? No, right? The lands at the time, the land at the promised land at the time was filled with enemies. There were bad guys in, inside, right? And there were wicked people inside the land, the promised land, and there were death, animals, plants, human beings were present in the land too. So the promised land is not a perfect place, right? So to, 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 very good doesn't mean perfect. We need to understand this. And this is an important point. It is, it is very good in the purpose of God, but it doesn't mean perfect, right? And so let me go. So I already explained the first point that the Garden of Eden was a localized place and animals is only animals inside the garden that were vegetarians. Now, what about the second, the second point? I'm gonna what about the second point? What about the, the, the curse in Genesis chapter three? How do how do we understand the curse? As I, as I explained early on, the curse is referring to the the, the, the protected environment, uh, the, the, the environment of, of, of Adam, right? That Adam was before he sinned, he lived in a protected environment, but after he sinned, he no he no longer lived in that protected environment. And so the ground was cursed with respect to him. And again, this is not a new interpretation. You find this in Augustine too. Augustine refers to Genesis chapter 3, verse 18, where it says that thorns and thistles shall, shall it bring forth to you. Now, does it mean that the thorns and thistles only began to exist after Adam's sin? No. This is how Augustine explained. He says, it could be that in view of the many advantages found in different kinds of seeds, these plants ha had a place on earth without affecting man in any way. So the thorns and thistles already exist before Adam's sin, but they do not affect human beings. Okay, but after they sin, then they become affected by these things. Now, I think a, a similar explanation can be given, right, for virus and COVID, COVID virus, for example, right? So, I mean, this virus could be around for a long, long time, or it could also be created by human beings uh, as a result of uh, genetic mutation or whatever, but that, that's a separate issue. But suppose the, the virus existed for a long time. It could be that you know, in before human sin, though this things don't affect Adam and Eve. But after Adam and Eve sin, 
they and their descendants, the human race, you know, becomes vulnerable, right? They, they lost the divine protection, right? So they become susceptible, vulnerable to illness and death. And that's what we see, right? Throughout history that human beings fall sick and die. Okay, so, so um, this is Augustine's explanation. Now, what about Romans chapter eight? Now, some people ask, now, doesn't this passage talk about you know, uh, the creation groaning in labor? And isn't that the result of human sin? Isn't that the result of the curse in Genesis chapter three? Well, if you look closer at this passage and compare it with Jeremiah chapter four, verse 23 to, 30, verse 23 to 31. Now, it's very interesting if you compare these two passages. In Jeremiah chapter four, it says, I look on the earth, Jeremiah looked on the earth, and before it was without form and void. It was without form and void. And to the heavens, and they had no light. For I heard a cry of a woman in labor, anguish as of one giving birth to her first child, the cry of the daughter of Zion, gasping for breath, stretching out hands, woe is me, I'm fainting before the murderers. So you find you know, the mentioning of labor pains here, just as is mentioned in Romans chapter eight. However, you also find you know, the phrase without form and, or, and without form and void, tohu wabahu, right? And these are the same words that is used for Genesis chapter one, verse two. And this is before Genesis chapter three, right? So this is before human beings fall into sin, right? Genesis chapter one is, is talking about, Genesis chapter one, verse two is talking about what happened before humans were created. And so this describes the state before the cursing of the ground in Genesis chapter three. So what this means is that the labor pains in Romans chapter eight is not necessarily referring to what happened after human sin. It's referring to something that happened earlier on. So what the Bible is trying to say may well be this, that God subjected creation to fertility and bondage to decay before human sin. And when God created human beings, God wanted human to subdue the earth, right? Remember Genesis chapter one, verse, Genesis chapter one, verse 27. Right, so God's plan was for humans to subdue this, uh, this creation, which was uh, subjected to futility. Uh, and and you no, know, as, 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 as humans do this work of subduing and have, having dominion, if, if humans had not sinned, they would have been able to transform the, the rest of creation back uh, to, 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 a, to, to a, 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 a more perfect state. However, humans failed in their mission, right? Adam and Eve sinned. They, they, they sadly failed to accomplish their mission due to their moral and spiritual failures. And therefore, the creation was left right, in the state of groaning. And humans also brought death upon themselves as the result of their sin. And creation was left in a state of groaning, but this will finally be liberated at the final redemption of God's people in Genesis, as, as Romans chapter eight goes on to say, right? So even though humans failed, but God has a plan of redemption. And that's why God uh, promised Adam and also uh, revealed himself to the later prophets that he will send a savior, a Messiah into the world and he will accomplish salvation for humankind. And the Messiah came right in the person and he is Jesus Christ. And so, Jesus and Jesus will come again he, he, at his second coming, right? And when he come again, there will be a final redemption, and where the sons of God's sons, the sons of God will be revealed, right? So, for those who believe in Jesus, believe in His name, we will, we will become the, the children of God, and we will be revealed um, as the children of God uh, in our full glory, right? When Jesus comes again the second time. In, in Jesus' second coming. And at that time, the rest of creation will be liberated as well. So this is the glorious hope, the glorious promise and the glorious hope, which Romans chapter eight tells us. Now, some people may ask, so why, why would God you know, create all these dinosaurs and let them go extinct, right? Remember, remember, this was the question that Christopher Hitchens asked, the atheists asked. Now, we, there are a few points in response. The first point is that the assumption that every creature, including dinosaurs, exists only for the sake of humans can be challenged. One might affirm that at least some of these creatures might be valuable independent of human beings. 
the value of their existence in history is not denied by their extinction, just as the, just as the fact that other creatures, including humans, die does not imply that their existence have no value, regardless of whether they go extinct or not. Right? So the fact that they go, they go extinct doesn't mean that their lives have no value. Right? They still live their lives. Right? Their lives are still valuable. Complaints about the suffering of billions of creatures over long history often ignore the fact that with the increased length of history, not only does the amount of suffering increase, but the amount of pleasure, the amount of pleasure increase as well. So this is the first point. The second point is that this objection neglects the possibility suggested in the Bible that parts of creation may well have been created for the appreciation by angels. So a lot of people assume that you know, all, all animals are created for human, for the sake of human beings. Well, the Bible doesn't actually say that, right? Um, it could be for the appreciation of angels too. So for example, the angels shouted for joy at God's initial creation in Job chapter 28. Disobedient angels, however, will be motivated to destroy God's work rather than to appreciate them. So, um, you know, the Bible implies that there were angels who disobeyed, who disobeyed God and that's where Satan come from, right? So Satan was a fallen angel. And these fallen angels, they could cause destruction on the rest of creation. So the, 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 the mutations, the extinctions could have been caused by the work of Satan, right? Demonic forces. Now, we can look at this uh, extinction from various perspectives. We can look at it from the scientific perspective and we can also look at it from a theological perspective. From a scientific perspective, well, you will hear a lot of scientists say that the reason why the dinosaurs went extinct was because there was a meteor, right? A meteor crash on the, onto the earth millions of years ago. And because the meteor crashed the earth, you know, that caused the earth environment to change drastically and that's how the dinosaurs went extinct. That is from a, that's a scientific uh, description of what happened. However, it is, it is possible, we, we can ask the question of how, how come the, the meteor crushed the earth? Is it a purely natural event? Well, not necessarily. It, you know, this scientific explanation doesn't exclude the possibility that the meteor could have crushed the earth as the result of work done by fallen angels, right? So, in fact, the Bible tells us that Satan can cause natural disasters. Say, if you read Job chapter one, you'll find that you know, um, Job, you know, he, he lost his children, why? Right? Because they died of natural disaster, right? Something fell on them, right? And we know that that is the work of the de devil, Satan, right? because that, the, Satan has a conversation with God before that happened, right? And God allowed Satan to um, test Job. Remember, so that event is not, uh, it, it is, is you know, is it's not a purely natural event, right? That they are, you know, Satan is attacking Job and his family, and Satan can cause natural disasters too. And so, you know, this can explain how the dinosaurs went extinct. And there are evidence for demonic forces too, even in the scientific literature, right? So if you look at this journal article published in the Journal of Religion and Health, this is a peer, this is a peer reviewed scientific journal article, a well-respected journal article. It talks about the growing evidence for demonic possession, right? So we have evidence for, demonic, for, for demons, right? And, and psychiatrists find this very difficult to explain away naturalistically. Now, I don't have time to go through this in detail, but if you're interested, you can check out this article for yourself. But I just want to point out to you that uh, the existence of demons is not implausible, right? There is good evidence to show that they do exist. And then some people will ask, okay, um, demons, God exists, demon exists, but why does God allow demons to cause harm to human beings and other animals? Now, to answer this question, we can look at what is called the connection building theodicy. And this theology was proposed by a philosopher called Robin Collins. He's, he says, he explains that we can glimpse a good purpose for why God created creatures, conscious agents that are vulnerable to each other and to the environment. 
And this, such vulnerable creatures can affect each other for good or ill in deep ways. Besides being interesting good, the ability to affect one another's welfare allow for the possibility of eternal bonds of appreciation, contribution, and intimacy, which are of great value. Since moral evil and suffering will inevitably exist in the universe with such creatures, right? We, we can conclude that the existence of combination of the universe with the type of evil we find in this world is not surprising given Christ, Christianity, given Christian theism. Now, what Collins is trying to say is that God created angels and God created human beings not only to love God, but also to love the rest of creation. Right? And because of this, our actions will have consequences. Will have consequences on other creatures. So, for example, you know, if you live according to God's teaching in the Bible, right? If we be, be a good father, be a good husband, our family will be blessed. But if we disobey God, right? If we um, treat our wives, our children badly, then they will be affected. Our actions have consequences on others, not only other human beings, but animals too, right? And, and it's the same thing for angels as well, right? God has a purpose for, for their existence. And you no, know, God created angels for a purpose. But if angels disobey God, they can cause destruction and harm to the rest of creation too. Okay, and so this is all related to God's purposes for creation. And so these connections, right? God wants you know, these, these connections to occur not only between humans and God, between, but also between humans and angels that come to their aid. Right, so many parts of the Bible, for example, in Daniel chapter 10, talks about angels coming to help human beings. So uh, all these you know, this connect connections occur there too. And also between humans and the rest of creation, between angels and between angels and God. So there are all kinds of creation, uh, all, all kinds of connections. And so this explains why is it that angelic fall can affect the rest of creation. Now, finally, I want to say a bit more about the nature of animal suffering. Actually, this is not a straightforward issue because scientists have debated about, about this. Is it really the case that other animals truly experience suffering? Well, when we look at them, you know, it seems that it's quite obvious that animals do suffer, right? However, the issues are not so straightforward. So let me explain. The first thing we need to note is that creatures which do not have a nervous system, well, they do not actually suffer. So for example, um, their reaction may just be a protective reaction to harmful stimuli, but this does not necessarily imply that they experience pain. So if you look at a snail, right? if you touch a snail, it will withdraw into its shell. This is, um, you, you may think that the, nail actually, the, the snail actually suffer pain, but actually it does not because it doesn't have the nervous system. So it doesn't actually suffer pain. It withdraw into the shell as a protective reaction. Right, to harmful stimuli, but it doesn't imply that they actually they actually feel pain. You know, there's there's no evidence for that, because they don't have nervous system. And well, we can talk about fish as well. You know, scientists still debate whether fish suffer or not. I mean, fish have brains, but their brains are very small and they lack certain structures. And interestingly, now now these people are talking about AI, right? artificial intelligence, and robots. Now. Non-conscious robots can also have similar behaviors to human beings, right? I mean, robots, you know, we, we, people can create robots that you know, look similar to humans and they may even cry. Robots, can, you know, they may even design robots that can, that can, appear, to, that can you know, appear, appear to cry. But does it mean that robots actually have pain? No, they don't feel pain, right? They don't have, because they are not conscious, right? So they are, they are pain, they are, what appears, you know, they, have, they may appear to be painful, I mean, we can, we can create robots that appear to be painful, but it doesn't mean that they actually feel pain. So our observation of behavior is not an infallible guide to the presence of pain. Right? So this is the take home message, an important point to note. Um, now, there are, there are a lot of details, actually, I'll skip this, but that, that's, that's the um, point, the take home message you want to emphasize. Um, and, and there's scientific evidence right, for, for the things that I, I said. Right? So uh, because of lack of time, I shall skip these points. 
um, basically this point is talking about the brain structure, you know, that some brain structures are related to the experience of pain, and these brain structures are lacking in other animals. And so um, they may not truly feel pain. Right? This is the point that I'm trying to say. So this is the first point. The second point is that even, even if they feel pain, they may lack self-awareness. Okay, they may, they may lack awareness of themselves. So they may feel hurt and cry, those, those animals, but they are not aware of themselves feeling hurt. Because again, um, it could be you know, that their brain structures is very different from human brains. And so the conclusion is that God may have created these creatures in such a way as to spare them from real pain. Okay, so this is a very important point to note. And uh, uh, well, this is one of the response to those atheists right, who ask, how come there's so much animal suffering? What the, one, one possible response is that they may not actually truly suffer, even though they appear to suffer, but this does not mean that they truly suffer. Right? So this is the first point. Now, the second point is that even if they truly experience suffering, it could be that this suffering will ultimately work for the good of those creatures. For all we know, these creatures might enter into the afterlife. They may also have eternal life. I mean, they, they, may, you know, they may also enter into the future kingdom in which their suffering might result in a deeper appreciation of eternal joy. And they may be compensated for any suffering that they experience on earth. In fact, there are a number of passages in the Bible which indicate that animals will be redeemed in the future as well. Right? So their lives are not meaningless. Right? As I said earlier on, their lives have value. And there are, passages, there are passages in the Bible which imply that you know, they have eternal life too. So we can look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 1920, which talks about the redemption of Christ is for all things. And, and this of all things, of course, refer to the entire cosmos, which include these creatures as well. And based on passages like this, in fact, quite a number of theologians in Christian history have affirmed that uh, people like John Wesley, for example, you know, he, he believes that animals have eternal uh, John Wesley. So I, I, I think I heard earlier on there's a, there's, there are, there's a Methodist pastor here, right? So John Wesley believed that animals have eternal life. Martin Luther as well, right? These animals will be redeemed in the future. Okay? Luther, Calvin, Wesley, they all believe this. So we can find in the Bible, Romans chapter 8, it talks about creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. And this indicates that there's a hope for animals too. And of course, Isaiah talks about in the future kingdom, there, there will be animals according to Isaiah, right? The wolf shall lie with the lamb, etc. And so there is hope for animals as Martin Luther himself realized. Luther was an animal lover. He had a dog, right? Who accompanied him for many years. And when, when his dog died, or was dying, you know, he told his dog, you know, be, be comforted little dog, that thou too, in the resurrection, shall have a golden tail. Right? So when Jesus Christ comes again the second time, the, um, the dog will also be resurrected as well. And so uh, John Wesley says, the objection based on animal suffering vanishes away if you consider that something better remains after death for these creatures also that this shall likewise one day be de delivered from the bondage to corruption and shall then receive an ample amends for all their present sufferings. Right? So there's hope for animals too. So in conclusion, I would like to conclude with these words by William Lane Craig. He says, even though the problem of evil is the greatest objection to the existence of God, yet at the end of the day, at the end of the day, God is the only solution to the problem of evil. For if God does not exist, then we are lost without hope in a life filled with gratuitous and unredeemed suffering. Right? So not only us, but animals too. You know, they die. You know, it's like everything is just an accident. You know? They come by accident, they die by accident, and there's no meaning or purpose to all the suffering that we have all endured, that, that they endured. However, because we have good reasons to believe that God exists, the Kalam cosmological argument proved that there's a God. The resurrection, the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection shows that Jesus is God. 
And therefore, God is the final answer to the problem of evil. For he redeems us from evil and takes us into the everlasting joy of the incommensurable good, which is fellowship with himself. And therefore, because we serve a real and living God, we have hope in the midst of evil and suffering. And this hope is not only applied to animals, but for us too. So we can thank God that you know, we can have this hope, even as we face the pandemic, right? we know that we have eternal hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I shall end here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lok, for the presentation on this question of evolution and creation. So uh, we have a few questions. So let's go to first question. We'll go. We'll we'll, we'll ask the first question to Dr. Lok, and there are around five questions for Professor Kwan from central the students in uh, the seminary. So let's ask the first question to Dr. Lok from David Raj, Pastor David Raj. Will there be evil in the millennial rule? So probably you would like to say whether you are a millennialist, pre-millennialist or <laughs> evil before the fall. So he's asking whether it'll there will be evil in the millennium the rule of Christ. Yeah, so uh, you know, as you pointed out, Dominic, you know, this question is related to your view about eschatology, right? About the millennium kingdom, whether you know, the, the so-called thousand years kingdom in Revelation, you know, how, how do you understand that? You know, is it uh, right. pre-millennial? You know, is, is that something that will happen? You don't, yeah. you are post-millennial, yeah. Yeah, so um yeah, so, so yeah, pre-meal, are meal or post meal, right? Now this is a huge, huge uh, issue. I don't have time to explain this. Um, but I, I don't see how this affects the, the theodicy which I have defended here, right? Uh I mean this doesn't affect our response to the atheists you know, when they argue from the problem of evil. I, I think we can give a response to them without requiring to settle this issue about pre-meal, post meal, army. I mean, if you ask me, my, my own personal view, I I I'm I, I personally think that the premium view is closer to the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, but but it's not something that I, I would hold on you know, uh, with all my life. I don't think this is a central issue to, to central doctrines of Christianity, right? So I, I'm happy you know, to um, consider other views. Yeah, but if you ask me, let me this is my own personal view. Um, but um, yeah, then, you know, we, we can talk about this in the future, but I don't think this is something that we need to talk about today. Yeah. Right, right. And if you take the literal view, we see Satan is bound the literal uh, for 1000 years so he comes yeah. back after that so yeah so probably that that sense mm -hmm. okay so okay yeah, so i mean regardless of regardless of which meal is correct right we got we know that we have a glorious and joyful hope in jesus christ right? Right, so that right. is certain yes okay thank you thank you All right so i think we need to we'll accommodate some some of this questions into the QA as well. Uh, Karthik has said that his question on natural evil has not been answered. You've asked the question. Uh, Professor Kwan answered the criteria. So he wants to ask, is natural evil also rooted in the wrong use of our free will? Uh, that question. And then we have some questions from CIT as well. Uh, yes. <clears throat> in short, uh, it's a question about the source of evil. Now, I think uh, evils can be divided into more evil and uh, natural evils. Now, I think uh, the two are uh, interrelated. More evil is resulted mainly from the abuse of free will given by God to human beings. Uh, and then natural evil, uh, for me, I think uh, is a result of the uh, allowance for higher good for God in this world, the higher good including solidarity, which is similar to 
uh, Andrew's uh, uh, connection to theology. That is, we're living in a world where with solidarity with other beings, mainly human beings, but maybe also the, the creation and angelic beings, etc. And then uh, the task for human beings is to use a free will to shape their character so that we, uh, we, we are closer to the image of God uh, to be, we realize the, the, uh, the God's uh, uh, virtues in our life. Now, so in this process, uh, suffering can be, can be an opportunity for us to, uh, to decide how to shape our own personality. So in fact, uh, these have been covered uh, before. So uh, in short, uh, I, I believe that uh, more evil mainly is a result of the abuse of freedom, but natural evil may have other reasons uh, as I've said, yeah. Is that okay? okay? okay thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we'll ask one, one question to Dr. Andrew, but then go back to a question to Professor Kwan. Uh, should we hold gap theory, age old theory, gap theory to accommodate scientific discoveries? You know, okay. the gap, yeah. No. <laughs> one and two. Uh, we have to be very careful here, right? We have to be very careful not to interpret the Bible according to science, right? Rather, we have to interpret the Bible according to the proper rules of hermeneutics. So the rules of hermeneutics include, right, we need to consider the genre of the literature, right? The, the kind of literature that the Bible is, the, the, the Bible is, the genre, the context, the meaning of the words, the grammar, right? And the, and the context is very important. So just now, when I talk about the view of John Collins, I mentioned that John Collins, he's an Old Testament scholar. Now he did not interpret the Bible according to science. He says that the Bible does not exclude a gap between verse one and verse two. Now he, he's, the reason why he said that is not based on science, right? Rather the, the, reason, the reason why he said that is based on the context, the meaning, the, the grammar, the, con, no, the, the when you look at all these criteria, you'll find that the Bible does not, the Bible does not say that there is no gap. Okay, you see what I'm trying to say? The Bible does not say that there's no gap. And therefore, if you read the Bible according to proper hermeneutics, you'll find that the Bible doesn't exclude a gap. That's what he says. So he's not using science to interpret the Bible. We have to be very careful here. I encourage you all to read his book. His, his book is really good. Right? It really help you to understand Genesis very well. And once you understand the Bible properly, once you interpret it properly, you'll find that there's no conflict with science. Okay, So this is a very important point, right? We are not using science to interpret the Bible. Rather, we are interpreting the Bible according to the rules of hermeneutics. But the result of that is that there's no conflict with science. You see what I'm trying to say, right? So uh, the, the rules of interpretation is not based on science. But the result of interpretation has no conflict with science. These are two different things. We need to distinguish them very clearly. Right. I hope that's clear. Uh, is it clear, Dominic? Do you, do you want me to explain this further? Clear? Is it clear? Thank you. Okay, so the, there is a follow-up question. The word used for day in Genesis and Exodus are same, yom, right? So why can't we believe that God created the whole universe in six days? Why can't God create the universe in six literal days? Now, yeah. I'm not saying that, I, I, I never say that God cannot, right? Of course, God can create in six literal days. I mean, God can create in six seconds too. God doesn't need six 24 hours days, right? God can create in six seconds. God can create everything in six milliseconds. God doesn't need six 24 hours, right? God can, God can do whatever he wants. So, the, the, but, the point, but the point here is that what does God actually do, right? So God can use six days. God can use six seconds. God can use six billion years. God can do, God has, a lot of, God has all this freedom. But what does God actually choose to do? And my point is that the Bible doesn't actually tell us, right? If you read, again, if you follow the rules of hermeneutics, if you look at the context of that passage, I mentioned just now that if you look at the day seven, for example, it is very clear that day seven is longer than the 24 hours, right? So if day seven can, if day seven is longer than, is, if day seven is longer than 24 hours, then the days before that may well be longer than 24 hours too. So the point here is that the Bible doesn't say clearly that it must be 24 hour day, right? The Bible doesn't say that. And so when we read the Bible, we must be very careful about what the Bible actually says 
and what the Bible does not say clearly, right? We, we must not read our own ideas into the Bible. This is this is something very important. All right. So we have around now around ten questions for Professor Kwan. Maybe I'll combine some of them. Uh, all right. So regarding moral objectivism, the the argument is on the basis that God is the giver of moral law. Okay, so yeah, yeah, that's that's true. So second, can uh, God has placed everything. So when a person dies due to extreme heat or extreme rain, who should count accountable for the cause? Maybe you can respond to this, Professor. Mm, you, the question is, uh, if a person dies from extreme heat or rain? Yeah, so who is, who is accountable? Mm -hmm. Now, I think uh, this is a kind of a lateral evil. And, uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, the, I'm not sure really the, the, the point of the question here, but uh, just allow me to, to, to say it, uh, in general that uh, if we have uh, a question is asking about, uh, for example, the source of uh, the, the extreme heat or rain, uh, they, they may be lateral disasters. And natural disasters uh, happen due to the natural laws uh, given to the uh, natural world by God, uh, and uh, we are we are part of the creature, so that's why uh, we depend on a, a lot of uh, uh, delicate conditions for survival. Now that shows our finitude, and also that gives uh, humans the freedom to adjust to the environment or even to change the environment to develop the technology and, and so forth. Now, so I think, uh, for example, in, in, uh, nowadays we talk a lot about climate change. So maybe partly the, the extreme heat or extreme rain, uh, the, the lateral uh, aberrations may be the result of uh, the excessive development of human technology. So in, in some way, God does not take care of everything because they have the natural law, but in this natural uh, world, uh, running according to these natural laws, there are a lot of challenges for, for human beings, not only individuals, but human the human species. So we need to develop, <clears throat> in face of these natural calamities, uh, challenges, we need to develop our science, we understand the causes of this heat or rain, and also we, we also need to uh, say build a safer house, uh, we also, in, in, in terms of disasters, we can help to save our, our labors. Uh, some of us may even sacrifice our lives to save our labors. So in all these uh, situations, all these occasions, uh, we, as I've said, these are opportunities for us to, to achieve the, the higher good. So in a way, God is accountable for the setup of this world, but God uh, does all this for a moral reason. So God allows this for more reason. Now, of course, uh, some people may suffer a lot, but uh, it seems to me, in fact, uh, many things uh, talked by Andrew can also be applied. That is, uh, those uh, sufferings can be redeemed or compensated by God. So our task is to face these uh, natural challenges with grace, with love, and also with wisdom. So this is a challenge for human beings. And God allowed this for, for, uh, for, no, for reasons uh, like this. Now, that may not explain everything, but uh, that is a framework of theology. I, I think that makes sense a lot. Uh, and then it gives human beings responsibility and accountability as well. We cannot blame everything on God. In fact, how to deal with natural disasters or our inner evil, it depends a lot on ourselves, our own actions, our collective actions as a human species. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I'll combine two questions, one question by Salim and the other on moral objectivity and subject. So if the moral law is objective, why, why are there so many subjective explanations? Now, uh, I think uh, in philosophy, but in life, there are always a lot of explanations. For example, uh, say, suppose you are a very beautiful lady, you, you see that uh, you, you regularly meet some guy, uh, some man, so there may be a chance 
or maybe that is uh, an intentional uh, action to approach you to 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 uh, to, to develop a, a relationship with you, so and so forth. Now, so the existence of many explanations themselves is not a question. In science, in 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 our life, there are always a lot of explanations. Some are subjective, some are objective. So we need to find the best explanations. Now, for example, scientists uh, detect a lot of phenomena, say in a cloud chamber, and they find the best explanation is that the, this phenomenon in the cloud chamber is uh, caused by some uh, radioactive decay. Uh, so there are a lot of subjective explanations. You may, you may say that these phenomena are just subjective illusions, but if many people see it, these phenomena repeat uh, regularly, then the, the explanation that it's just an illusion is not so good. Now, so, so the scientists uh, search for uh, objective explanation, and, and if in the end, they find that the, exp uh, the explanation with reference to radio radioactive decay explains the phenomenon nicely. Now, so the problem is that there are apparently more laws. So there are either two options. One is to deny those small laws uh, and say that everything is uh, subjective. So there are, and why are there these explanations appealing to subjectivism? And I've explained there are three main arguments. One is the argument from moral diversity. Second, the argument from tolerance. And third, the argument from moral dilemmas. And I have pointed out that although there are these explanations uh, from the perspective of uh, subjectivism or relativism, I have explained all these arguments are uh, uh, incorrect. Uh, more diversity just may mean just human limitations. Uh, our moral knowledge is not infallible. So more diversity does not mean uh, uh, more relativity. Second, uh, the argument from tolerance is self-contradictory because it already assumes tolerance is an objective value. And third, more dilemmas can be solved by our by my system of intuitionism. We we formulate the the uh, moral laws with the k tourist paribus, that is all other things equal cross, and they are uh, and then they become valid. Okay. Now, so first of all, I argue that all these subjectivist explanations are not supported by good arguments, and then the the final choice is that. There are so many things which are obviously evil. Killing an innocent person, uh, somebody uh, deceiving you, taking all your money and properties uh, for no good reason, and then they, they even harm you or kill your family. Can you say that, oh, the, the feeling that it is horrendous evil is just a subjective illusion? I don't think so. Everyone from the heart will say that these actions are evil. Now, so appealing to our common moral experiences, which are shared by the major civilizations, the major religions, even many a atheists, they, they will agree that these actions are evil. And then they are supported by our, uh, a strong a conscience and the moral intuitions. So when we count the two sides, the subjective explanations or the objective explanations, I argue that the subjective explanations fail to be grounded by sound arguments and then contradicted by our uh, by our common conscience of humankind, which is uh, prevalent in history. Now, but the main point is many people point out that some most calls may be subjective, but to argue for relativism, they have to say all moral standards are relative. But, but the premise for this moral argument only says some moral standards are objective. So as long as you believe that there is some objective evil, it means that you believe in objective good. So you cannot be a relativist. And I, and I argue that nobody in a real life can really be a uh, foregoing relativist. Nobody can. Just think about how you uh, go on your life. Uh, if a teacher fail their obligations, if your friends deceive you, if your parents kill you, rape your wife, would you say it's okay? It's just subjective? I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we'll ask, I mean, we are taking a bit of time from Professor Chan, but yeah, we'll yeah. extra time. <laughs> he, 
his topic is also very, very interesting. Uh, let me ask the next question to Dr. Andrew Lowe. The book states to abide on the other seven minutes. Let me help mute. Uh, okay. All right. So here's the question Adam's sin resulted in physical and spiritual death. Uh, why didn't they die? Whereas in the case of Ananias and you know Sapphira, they died on the spot. Why didn't Adam and Eve just die on the spot? You know when they sinned. Your, your view. Uh, well, I, I suppose God can do it whatever way He wants, right? Um, but if if Adam and Eve die on the spot, then <laughs> then uh. He will have to recreate human. He will have to create human beings all over again, right? We, we won't be. We won't be here, right? Isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, we won't be here. <laughs> yeah, we won't be here. Yeah. All right. So let me combine some questions for Professor Kwan. There's one question. I'll I'll just answer it very quickly. If God's the moral governor and director, why do humans indulge? in immorality well because they got free will and free will is intrinsic to the whole concept of morality uh, so actually the question only goes on to prove that god exists as a moral because the the moment you talk about free will so it's it's actually not uh in contradiction to the moral argument let me combine the two other questions what is the cause of moral flaw is this due to the presence of evil the world is good but it's not perfect does that mean that there are flaws in the world? So, Professor Kwan and Dr. Andrew. Uh, I think uh, per perfect uh, can have two senses. One is more, in, uh, that is uh, per per perfect may means just lack of imperfection, uh, lack of more evil. But the other sense of uh, perfection is a kind of consummation, that is the realization of the highest values in every aspect. Now, so uh, I all I agree with uh, Andrew that uh, in a in a uh, original world created by God, God, uh, where Adam lived, it is perfect in the sense of uh, the natural world is a good place. Uh, there are no obvious uh, evils, uh, no more evils. The freedom has not been abused yet, but uh, it seems that uh, although human beings have a close relationship with God. Uh, the human freedom is still to be tested. And in fact, even after four, uh, as I've said, many higher goods can be realized despite the four. And in fact, the four uh, give us the opportunities, say, of redemption. Say, incarnation becomes a great good. Uh, exactly because humankind has fallen and full of in, uh, incarnation, God's uh, uh, human uh, divine nature can be com combined with the human nature. So, for example, the nation says that, in fact, uh, uh, redemption is kind of a sharing of divine nature. Uh, so, in many sense, uh, the four is a... Uh, so, initially, the, 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 the sages, uh, this, this, there's no evil, but uh, the, free, the freedom can be used properly and then maybe the human beings can enter into eternal life in, in, in God, but God, but, uh, but uh, human uh, Adam failed. But just like a, a master chess player, sometimes uh, we know that your, your opponent can take move A or move B. A, chess, a master chess player always plans for our response. If you do, um, uh, if you take the move A, I'll, I'll respond in this way. If you take move B, I respond in, in that way. Now, so God is a master chess player. So if Adam fell, so God has a second plan, which can also bring bring out greater good, even from the fall. That is, that does not mean that human beings uh, deserve some kind of uh, a credit for this theme that is entirely due to God's uh, infinite wisdom. So I think uh, that, that's how I will the whole thing here. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, that that question also, you know, refers to the uh, the concept of middle knowledge and uh, best of possible worlds. Probably, Dr. Andy would like to shed some further light on that very quickly. 
Uh, can you remind me the question again? I was listening to Professor Khan and I forgot the question. The world, the world is not good. well. If the world is not perfect, it it doesn't mean there is evil and there there are flaws in the world. Oh, okay. Um, now, uh, and Professor Kwan was talking about you know yeah. the chess player and yeah how God yeah planned. that's right and we, we um now there there are different. Understandings of the word perfect, as Professor Kwan has explained very well, right? This word can be understood in different ways. And the important point here is that we need to understand what is the purpose for why God created the world in the first place. So does God have to create a universe where everything works uh, efficiently, super efficiently, like you, know, uh, you can actually fly in the speed of light? W will that be considered perfect? Is that your idea of perfection? Well, no. I mean, God doesn't have to create that kind of world, isn't it? So, so um, the reason. So, we need to understand what is the purpose for why God created things in the first place. And I already explained during my talk that the most important purpose, right, is for us to have this relationship with God, right? This love relationship with God, and this love relationship with God requires testing. I think Professor Kwan pointed this out just now. He used the word test, and I think this word testing is very important, right? So, in order for testing to be possible. No, that there, there, no, there, there could be certain constraints, for example, right, that allow it to happen, and I think that is um, what happened, right? Uh, and that certain constraints um, allow for the possibility of testing, and that is all within the perfect plan of God, right? Because uh, this love relationship between us and God requires this testing, right, as as part of the process. And when we choose to respond to God in a positive way, then we will experience God working out things for good in our lives, such that eventually in the future kingdom, there will be no need for testing anymore, right? But that is at the later stage, right? That's not um, at the beginning stage. So we need to understand, we need to have a holistic view of God's plan right, in order to answer this question, to, to put this question in, in the right perspective and to answer it. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Logan and Professor Kwan. Some, some, are, some are watching on Facebook. And so I got a question on WhatsApp. According to Dr. Lok, day seven is longer than 24 hours. How do we prove that? Okay, so uh, firstly, uh, if you look at day seven, you'll find that there's no mentioning. Um, you, you'll find that God, is, God, God rested, right? God rested from his creation. And if you look at Psalm 95, you, talk, you mentioned that God, God says to those people who don't believe him you know, that they shall not enter into my rest. So this shows that you know, this state of resting is still continuous. And you read Hebrews 4, you also find that, that you know, he, the author of Hebrews bring these ideas together as well. So, all the, so when you look at these, different, these three Bible passages, you find that you know, the, the, the state of rest continues. There's no mentioning of any ending right, to these states in the Bible. So we have good reasons to believe that you no, know, this is a state that God continues in, that these days you know, is not a, a limited duration, it, it extends much longer than 24 hour days. And so yeah, on that basis, that is part of the context, right? We look back at the first six days, you know, we can understand that you no, know, these are not necessarily meant to be literal, right? It can be taken as analogous, as I explained earlier on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lok. There are four or five more questions, but I think we'll pick it up later on. We'll take a break now, and then we'll, we will go to the third session with Dr. Chan. He gets 40 minutes to share and then 20 minutes of QA. That means that we'll go beyond the time, but I think it's okay with all. So you can take a break for five minutes and come back and then we'll, Dr. Chan will be here to talk about some of the questions relate to that uh, ethnic cleansing, ethnic wars in the Old Testament. So see you after five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Lok. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, I have uploaded the file, presentation file, so that uh, Dr. Chan is going to share. You can take a look. You can download that if you will. Uh, Professor Chan is having a little difficulty joining us right now. His audio device and video. So while he is on way, uh, trying to join us again, let's see if uh, we can take some some questions. Meanwhile, All right. So okay. So let's see this question: How should we see COVID nineteen in the context of divine sovereignty, the sovereignty of God? How we should see COVID-19 in the context of God the, or the sovereignty of God? Professor Kwan, would you like to? Well, uh, no, I think uh, sometimes uh, it is very difficult to, to, to talk about the meaning of a, a, a event in close distance. Now, for example, you have a, a big disease. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, does it contribute to your growth? Now, when, when you suffer, uh, when you are in the process of uh, uh, pain due to the disease, sometimes you cannot, you cannot really understand it. But after the disease, maybe after, uh, say, you, your efforts of rehabilitation, so after the process, you, you may discover that uh, your willpower has increased. And during the process, you start to appreciate your relationship with your family, which say, may have been alienated before, so on and so forth. Now, so uh, in, a, in, a, in the framework of sovereignty, I think, uh, of course, we can, as Christians, we believe that uh, COVID is part of a natural disaster uh, <clears throat> that is allowed by God. Uh, my general uh, ideas are, are still applicable. For example, I think uh, COVID uh, brings the whole world together uh, let, let the world understand that uh, we are all vulnerable, including the so-called advanced or, or the modernized society in the, in the West. But we find that human beings have solidarity after all. Now, so we, we start, I think uh, uh, that may uh, help us to, to bear one another's burdens in terms of not only human individuals, but uh, responsibilities. And uh, for the na other nations or even for others economic development. Uh, now and then the, in different uh, countries, for example, when we try to overcome the COVID, we, we also heard about a lot of uh, human heroism, uh, the doctors and the nurses uh, sacrificing uh, the health and, and life to, to save uh, a lot of patients. So again, these are the opportunities for us to take care of one another, also to, to grow into the image of God. Now, so God I'll allow this uh, for many reasons, uh, just like other natural disasters. And then you can, but you, I, I think uh, from a larger, longer perspective, I think uh, COVID is also a signal for, for the, uh, the frailty of human civilizations. Now, after the development of the modern civilizations, we, we feel self-sufficient. Uh, we believe that the science can defeat uh, diseases by vaccines, etc. Now, although the vaccines do help, but but now we, we see that this COVID is very tricky. Uh, a lot of new variants, which are more contagious, develop quickly. So, uh, for for the variants, the the vaccine become less uh, uh, effective, etc. So. Now I think uh, these are signals. I think I think maybe God has a, 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 a more important message for for the human beings. That is, we we are rely on our own efforts and technology, and we our hope is only for the material being. But what if the disease will not go away? What if our lives are always painful? Uh, what if we 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 find our civilization to be frail? I think it is a call to, to return to our spiritual roots, our relationship with God. 
Now, but uh, these are only hints and some suggestions. As I have said, the meaning of an event in your life uh, can only be determined uh, more holistically, maybe 10 years later. Now, so, so I think uh, it is, the COVID is far from over. And so at this stage, it is rather difficult to conclude uh, anything from our this uh, two years of experience here. Thank you, Professor Kwan. Yeah, uh, it's very difficult to see the whole picture when we are inside the problem. So that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Uh, there is one question. Let me let me quickly answer that. Uh, the question is uh, Proverbs sixteen four. God has made the wicked for the day of doom. What does it mean? Well, if you look into the context, you see verse three says, commit your works to the Lord, your thoughts will be established. And then verse five, everyone proud in heart is abomination to the Lord. And it's, it's also talking about God, the sovereignty of God. And you can link it to the New Testament verse in James, where it says, when you go to a new city, don't just trust in your own wisdom saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Commit your works to the Lord. And even if people think that, well, the wicked are prospering and everything happening, happening good with them, they're doing so good, as in Psalm 73, the question raised by Asaph. Uh, here, the verse assures us, saying that God is in control. He has made all things for himself. You know, nothing can bypass the, 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 the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, the power of God. And so even the wicked is for the day of evil, kind of a poetic expression, but in the context. I hope that answers. Uh, let's let's uh, look at another question here. How can we reconcile the protection of God and inflicted evil on innocence like child rape, abduction, etc.? cetera? Yep. Uh, is that a question for me? Yeah, yeah. Can you respond to that, Professor? Uh, the, the, the question is the uh, child rape adoption and... and yeah. Uh, the, what, what is the question? Innocent suffering evil, you know, child rape, abduction, etc. How can God's protection be reconciled? Now, okay, okay. Now, I think these are... Now, first of all, let me say that uh, I do not claim to understand uh, every particular evils happening to human beings, especially, uh, say, to little children, and uh, say, uh, uh, there are horrendous evils. Now, so my, my, uh, my approach to theology is that, uh, by and large, we can see the whole picture, uh, which understands that evil is part of our human task or our uh, human civilization, and God allows it for for good reasons and good purposes. Now, uh, for all, all all the things we have said, uh, free will, uh, high good, etc. Now, but for individual cases, I think we need to plead ignorance or at least to adopt the attitude of humility. When we face a serious case of child abduction, the suffering of a even the killing of an innocent child, I think it's better that uh, we, we remain silent. We, uh, we, 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 we pray for the, 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 uh, the, the suffering family and we try to do everything to bring the uh, killer into justice and to prevent uh, future cases of this uh, child abduction, etc. Now, so the Odyssey is not only a theoretical task, but uh, first of all, it, it is a practical task. We, we, we need to uh, learn to be humble. Uh, we, we learn to uh, suffer with the victims. Uh, we learn to be active to, to stop uh, these evils to happen again, or to, or to bring uh, the, uh, the criminals in the justice etc. Now, so uh, I, I do not claim that I, I can explain everything. Uh, so 
Uh, but in general, we, we can say that uh, these are the more evil. And the problem is, uh, first of all, let me take it a smaller scale. Suppose, uh, not to talk about travel adoption, but uh, say, we, we are friends, we are friendship, but friends can harm one another by betraying them. So what should God do? Now, we know, we know that uh, friendship is a source of our, our joy in life and also a source of a lot of good in our life. Now, and the, the reason we, we treasure friendship is that friendship is granted freely. The others love us, give us friendship freely. And they are not forced to love me. They are not bribed by my parents to pay them $10,000 uh, per month to, to be nice to me. They, are, they want to be my friends. They want to befriend me, so on and so forth. Now, so freedom is an essential component of friendship. But friendship can also harm. So that's why sometimes we sing, I, I, I like to be a rock. I want to be an island uh, because uh, uh, friendship causes pain or relationship causes pain. Now, so the problem for God is that if God gives us friendship and solidarity and connection, which is a great good and a source of great joy, but we are not robots. We are not puppets. We have freedom. So we also learn to love and sometimes we fail our friends. We fail God. So we harm one another. If God does not allow for that, then our relationship, our freedom, our responsibility for ourselves and for one another would not be real. Now, so there's a tragic fact of life. Either we want isolation or we want connection, but no freedom. So God uh, guarantees everything. Uh, but uh, so you can see that uh, the others is to, is, to, is to try to see that some, some facts of life are tragic and uh, God is good and God is love, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, we cannot want, we cannot have everything, every good without risk, without uh, the possibility of being harmed. Now, so rape or child adoption is a more serious type of moral evil. Now, so the, the, the same logic applies, but I, I, I hate to, to say that I can understand this or this or that, but, uh, but the question is, uh, you say, if God remove this type of uh, horrendous moral evil, but then maybe an ordinary betrayal would then be the most serious evil. The, whether something is horrendous also depends on our experiences. Uh, so if you want God to remove, so, so suppose we understand that God needs to give us some more evil, allow us freedom, even freedom to, to hurt one another, but uh, God constrain it, cap it to a certain degree, so by taking away all these more serious, more evils. But then after we have accustomed to this cleaner world, I think, and ordinary betrayal, because all, all friends are, are very nice, no, nobody is a criminal. Maybe a, a friend saying, uh, uh, saying nasty words will harm us, harm us so deeply. And then we will ask the same, ask God to remove everything. Now, so uh, the point is, I have no satisfactory answer to this question, but uh, logically, uh, we need to understand the, 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 whole, the whole scheme. And secondly, I want to say that uh, some, some people have been uh, severely injured, including raped or being abducted. Many people have undergone all these uh, evils. Some can recover. Some have shown uh, strong uh, resilience in this human evil. So in concentration camps, uh, many people have been suffer, suffer a lot a, a, as well, and they are being tortured, etc. And in some, maybe not the majority of cases, in some cases, we can, we can see the human spirit rise to a very high level. They sacrifice themselves, they even forgive uh, the, the persons who inflict the harm on them. Uh, now, so we cannot uh, take it for granted, but uh, we can see that uh, the, the greater the challenge, the higher the spirit can rise. But what if some who fail in this, isn't it unfair to them? 
Now, I think that theology has to be eschatological. It seems to me that uh, for human beings, some traumatic experience seem to be unredeemable. That is, we cannot see any way for an ordinary human being to overcome this traumatic uh, past experience. But for God, everything is possible. I, I believe in the, the death of the God's love, which and God's spirit can touch our spirit in such an intimate way that we cannot even conceive how God can transform our spirit. So even, even for all those victims of this horrendous evil in this life, as long as they are open to God, I believe in divine healing in such a way that all those uh, traumatic experiences can be uprooted from our life and we can learn to forgive and love even after such uh, horrendous experiences. And these uh, experiences, as I've said, are not common, but even in this life can be achieved by some heroic individuals. And I believe that with God's grace, as long as we turn to him, the, the, the healing by God's love can be complete. So uh, for us, some evils may seem unredeemable, but we can always have hope because God's power and God's healing power is always beyond our own imagination. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we wait for Dr. Chan as he tries to come. Uh, uh, Dominic? Yeah. Um, can I suggest that maybe we will leave Dr. Chan's talk to next time because we only have about 20 minutes left and I don't, I don't okay, think we okay. can finish it in 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so uh, why, why not we, we spend more time answering these okay. questions okay. Right, related okay. to COVID and things like that because um, okay. I think these are very, very important questions, questions for this time. Okay, and thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let me take one question here uh, by Giri. The Hebrew words for good, very good, perfect. So I need to write, I'm sitting on an exam, <laughs> Hebrew exam. Hebrew words for good, very good, and perfect. Well, let me, let, I've typed it, so I should go there on the chat. Good, tov, very good, neo, tov, and perfect. Tamim is very close to the Hindi, tamam, tamim. Tamam, you have heard the word, right? Tamam, entire, whole. So that's perfect. Whole. Oh, Dr. Chan can switch now. So let's see if uh, he can present very quickly his uh, part of the talk. Over to Dr. Chan. Bye. Okay, but uh, <clears throat> but the time is running out. So um, <clears throat> um, so I uh, perhaps um, <clears throat> we, we need I to extend uh, more time. No problem. Uh, we extend those... the time to, to three o'clock. Perhaps we can go. <laughs> okay. I'm Thank sorry, you. everyone. Uh, Okay, um, just a minute. So, uh, uh, can you uh, can you see my PowerPoints now? Can yes. you? Yes, we okay. can see. Uh, okay, so uh, I must be quick because um, the time is running out. Um, okay. Now, um, the topic ethnic wars and evil in the, in the Old Testament uh, is a very big one. Um, there are indeed many pressing ethical issues under this topic. Um, for example, uh, how could God be? How could how could God be possibly morally justified to intentionally to kill 70,000 Israelites just because of the King David's sin? How could God be possibly morally justified to command Abraham to kill um, the innocent child Isaac? How could God be possibly morally justified to, in to intentionally kill those innocent firstborn Egyptian infants and children during the 10th plague? And how could God be possibly morally justified to command the genocide of the Canaanites? Because of the limitation of time, I, my presentation will only address the fourth problem above. Okay, now consider the following passages. 
Okay, the, the first passage comes from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 20. Okay, however, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not live a life, anything that breathes, completely destroy them. The Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hevites, and Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Otherwise, they will teach you to follow all the detestable things they do in worshipping their gods, and you will sin against the law your God. Now, another passage comes from Joshua chapter 10. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the west of the foothills, and the mountain slopes, together with all the kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathe, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. And one more example from Joshua chapter 10. They devoted the city, that is Jericho, to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Now, in these passages, we see that God apparently commanded the Israelites to destroy totally the Canaanites, including the non-combatants and the innocents, such as children and infants. Because of these and similar passages in the Old Testament, Richard Dawkins, in his book, The God Delusion, describes the God of the Old Testament as a bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, an infant, uh, infanticidal and a genocidal. And Wesley Morriston says, God demands uh, that a lot of killing be done and that he wants this killing to include the slaughter of many non-combatants. On any plausible interpretation, God is commanding crimes against humanity and it would have been wrong for the Israelites to obey. Now, the argument mentioned uh, by the two scholars against the Old Testament God provided by these uh, critics of Christian theism can be formulated in the following way. Okay, the argument has one premise and one conclusion. Premise one, the Old Testament God, that is the God as depicted in the Old Testament, commanded the genocide of the Canaanites. Therefore, conclusion, statement two, the Old Testament God is not perfectly good. Now, the main question to be addressed by my presentation is this one, is the above argument. Uh, let's call it the genocide argument, a good argument. Now, my answer to this question is no. To argue for my answer, I shall rely heavily on Paul Copens and Matthew Flanagan's writings, and I shall also defend their ideas. Now, as I understand them, they provide three distinct defenses of Christian theism against the genocide argument. A, the hyperbolic reading defense, B, the greater good defense, and C, the defense by appealing to mystery. The hyperbolic reading defense is intended to show that the premise of the genocide argument is questionable, that we have good reasons for doubting the truth of the premise. The greater good defense is intended to show that the inference from the premise to the conclusion is questionable, that we have good reasons for doubting the logical correctness of the inference from the premise to the conclusion. It tries to show that even if the Old Testament God commanded the genocide of the Canaanites, it does not follow that the Old Testament God is not perfectly good. The defense by appealing to mystery is intended to show that even if all other defenses against the genocide argument fail, Christians can still be epistemically justified to maintain that the Old Testament God is perfectly good. Again, because of the limitation of time, I can only focus on the hyperbolic reading defense in my presentation. Okay, the hyperbolic events. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, the first way to rebut the genocide argument is to question the premise that is, the Old Testament God 
that is the God as depicted in the Old Testament, commanded the genocide of the Canaanites. Now, this premise is based on a literal interpretation of the relevant Old Testament passages. However, I must ask, how do we know that the authors or editors of those passages intended the passages to be understood in a literal way? Is it possible that the intended meaning of this passage, of those passages, is non-literal? Now, Paul Copen and Matthew Fanager argues that there are good reasons for thinking that the Vatican passages, especially the Hiram language, were not intended by their authors or editors to be understood literally, and that they were rather intended as containing hyperbole and exaggeration. Now, the Hebrew word Hiram means dedication to destruction. Let us call the phrases, do not live a life, anything that breathes, destroy with the sword, everything live in it, completely destroy them, left no survivor, destroy all who breathe, and the variants as Hiram language. Okay, let's, let's call those phrases Hiram language. So according to Copen and Franningen, the premise of the genocide argument is questionable. And the argument accordingly fails to be cogent, according to them. Now, if Copen and Flanagan are right, we do not have any good reasons for thinking that the Old Testament God commanded the genocide of the Canaanites, or that the Israelites committed the geno genocide of the Canaanites, or that the Old Testament ever makes such claims. So let's start with the book of Joshua. Okay. <clears throat> now, uh, let's look at um, the internal evidence showing that um, uh, the Hiram language in uh, Joshua should be interpreted uh, in a hyperbolic rather than a literal way. Okay. Now, as Nicholas Waterstaff, uh, his, uh, in his uh, article reading Joshua, points out, Joshua, Deuteronomy, and Judges form a single narrative, a connected literary unit. Here are the reasons okay, why they form a single narrative. Reason A, Joshua chapter 24, verses 28 to 31, mentioned Joshua's death and burial place and Timoth Sarah in the hill country of Ephraim. Judges, Chapter 2, verses 6 to 9, continues the narrative and mentions Joshua's death and burial place and Timur Harris in the hill country of Ephraim. Okay, so there's a continuity between the two books. And the second reason why they form a, a single narrative, the second reason, the first and last consonants are switched from Sirah to Harris, from, from uh, uh, Timna. Sirah to Timna Harris. Okay, this is a Hebrew literary device. So we have uh, we have good reason for thinking that those books, for example, Joshua and Judges, form a single narrative. Now, Judges also is connected with the first and second Samuel, with its reference to hill country of Ephraim. Hence, these books, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and 1 and 2 Samuel form a connected literary unit. However, we can note several apparent inconsistencies and tensions among the various relevant passages of these books. Okay, the first in uh, appearing inconsistency. Joshua chapter 11, verse 23 says, so Joshua took the entire land just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to their tribal divisions. Then the land had rest from war. However, Judges chapter 1, okay, 1 to 4, states that after the death of Joshua, much of the land was not yet concurred. Okay, the second apparent um, inconsistency. Joshua chapter 11, verse 
23 says that Joshua had already taken the whole land. However, one chapter later, just one chapter later in the same book, God said to Joshua, you are very old and there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. In Joshua chapter 14, Caleb asked for permission to drive out the Anakites from the hill countries. And Joshua chapter 16, 10 says, they, that is the Ephraimites and Manasites did not dislodge the Canaanites living in Jesha. To this day, the Canaanites live among the people of Ephraim, but are required to do forced labor, etc. So we can see that there are, in, it, it, there are apparent inconsistencies even between different passages within Joshua. Now the third um, apparent inconsistency, the book of Joshua said, then Joshua and all Israel with him turned around and attacked Derby. They took the city, its king and its villages and put them to the sword. Everyone in it, they totally destroyed. They left no survivors. They did to Derby and his king as they had done to Libna and his king and to Hebron. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western footholds, and the mountain slopes, together with all the kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the law, the God of Israel, had commanded. However, judges, Okay, Judges says at the beginning, after that, Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites living in the hill country, the Negev and the western foothills. They advanced against the Canaanites living in Hebron and defeated Shisha, Ahiman, and Toma. From there, they advanced against the people living in Derby. Okay, so here we can find apparent inconsistencies between judges, uh, between uh, Joshua and judges. Now, lastly, we can also note that the formulations of God's com uh, command, command are different in Joshua and judges. Joshua chapter 10, verse 40 says, so Joshua subdued the whole land, including the hill country, the Nietzsche, the western foothills and mountain slopes together with all the kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the law, the God of Israel had commanded. However, Judges chapter 2, 1 to 2, provides a different formulation of God's command, which did not mention at all the extermination of the Canaanites. Okay, the passage says the angel of the law went up from from Hugo to book him and said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led, and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you and you shall not make a covenant with the people of this land, but you shall break down their altars. Now Flanagan summarized the above inconsistencies and tensions. He said, therefore taken as a single narrative and taken literally Joshua, Chapters 1 to 11 gives a seemingly different account of events to that narrated by Judges and also to that narrated by the later chapters of Joshua itself. Now, uh, here we, uh, I can start presenting Franega's argument that the Hiram language um, is not to be interpreted literally. Rather, it should be interpreted uh, in a hyperbolic way, okay? Now the argument can be presented as, um, as two steps. Step one, since the aforementioned apparent inconsistencies between Joshua chapters one to 11 and the later chapters are so obvious, the author of Joshua probably was aware of those apparent inconsistencies. Since the apparent consistencies and tensions between Joshua and Judges are so obvious, the editors of those books probably also were aware of them as well. The author and the editors were not minors. They, are, they were not stupid, right? They would not want to affirm that both accounts, one of which asserts that the entire land was already occupied by Joshua and that all the Canaanites on the land were exterminated, 
and the other of which asserts that even after George's death, much of the land was still unoccupied. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, much of the land was still occupied by the Canaanites. So the author and the editors would not want to affirm that both accounts are literally true because they obviously clash with each other. Step two, since the early chapters of Judges read like down to earth history, and since the book of Joshua contains many formulaic phrasings, formulaic conventions, and highly ritualistic language, it is Judges which is to be taken literally, and Joshua should be understood as containing hyperbole and exaggeration. Now, here is some example of ritualistic language in Joshua. Okay. The book is framed by its opening narration of the ritualized crossing of the Jordan and by its closing narration of the equally ritualized ceremony of blessing and cursing that took place at Shechem. And the conquest narrative begins with the ritualized destruction of Jericho. Okay, and Wutterstorff also provides some examples of formulaic phrasings. Anyone, he said, anyone who reads the book of Joshua in one sitting cannot fail to be struck by the prominent employment of formulaic phrasings. Far more important is the formulaic clause struck down all the inhabitants with the edge of the sword. The first time one reads that Joshua struck down all the inhabitants of a city with the edge of the sword, namely in the story of the conquest of Jericho, one makes nothing of it. But the phrasing, or close variance thereon, gets repeated seven times in close succession in chapter 10, two more times in chapter 11, and several times in other chapters. The repetition makes it unmistakable that we are dealing here with a formulaic literary convention. So uh, we have, um, we have, uh, literary evidence showing that the Hiram language in Joshua should be understood in a hyperbolic way. Now, on the other hand, we, we have also external evidence supporting the hyperbolic reading of the Hiram language in Joshua. Now, historians of ancient Near East tells us that the composition and rhetoric of Joshua chapters 9 to 11 are very similar to the conventions writing about conquests in Egyptian, Hittite, Akkad, Akkadian, Moabite, and Aramaic texts. And that the common transmission code of that period is that victories are narrated in an exaggerated hyperbolic fashion in terms of total conquest, complete annihilation, and destruction of the enemy, killing everyone, leaving no survivors. Etc. This confirms that the human language used in Georgia and Deuteronomy should be understood as hyperbolic. Now, because of the internal and external evidence, we have good reasons for thinking that the human language in Georgia should be understood in a hyperbolic rather than a literal way. Okay, now let, let us move to Deuteronomy. Now, the Hiram language in Deuteronomy, as that in Joshua, should also be understood hyperbolically. There are two reasons for that claim. Reason one, first, as Waterstock asserts on the assumption that Deuteronomy and Joshua are both literally and linguistically connected and canonically sequenced. This interpretation of Joshua forces a back interpretation of Deuteronomy. If struck down all the inhabitants with the edge of the sword is a literal convention when used to describe Joshua's exploits, then it is likewise a, literal, a literary convention when similar words are used by Moses in his instruction to Israel in general and to Joshua in particular. The second reason why Deuteronomy should be understood in a hyperbolic way. Moreover, the book of Joshua clearly, explicitly, and repeatedly identifies what Joshua did in these chapters with the command that Moses had given regarding the Canaanites in Deuteronomy. 
Okay. Bible said he left no survivors. He totally destroyed all who breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. So if the language totally destroying, stri striking all the inhabitants with the edge of the sword and so on is hyperbolic, then the command cannot have been intended to be taken literally. So uh, we, we have already shown that the Hebrew language uh, uh, in the book of Joshua and the book of Deuteronomy should be understood in a hyperbolic way. Now let's uh, move to um, the case of Midianites in Numbers chapter 31. Okay, Numbers chapter 31 verse 7 records, they fought against Midian as the Lord commanded Moses and killed every man. And then Moses commanded the Israelites, now kill all the boys and kill every woman who has left with a man, but save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Okay, now we should, we, we can ask, okay, in Numbers chapter 31, did God not command the killing of non-combatants, including the boys and women? Now, the answer to this question is no. In Numbers 31, God only commanded Moses to fight against the Midianites and kill all the combatants. The commands to kill all the boys and every woman who has slept with a man did not come from God. Okay, it, come, it came from Moses. Now, there are three reasons for that claim. Okay, the first reason. Normally, in the Torah, when Moses utters a command on God's behalf, the passage begins with the Lord commanded Moses. This preface is absent from the commands in Numbers 31. So we can see here. It just says, and then Moses commanded the Israelites. Okay, so without the aforementioned preface. Okay. The second reason is that verse 7 states that the Israelites in fighting against the Midianites and killing all the men already fulfilled God's command. Okay. And Moses' command to kill women and children occurs only after this and appears to be on his own authority. The third reason. If one reads the laws of war that are elaborated in the book of Deuteronomy, which follows numbers, God himself commanded Israel not to kill non-combatants, such as women and children. He condemns the kind of conduct Moses commands here. Hence, hence numbers chapter 31 is not a piece of good evidence for thinking that God commanded genocide or the killing of non-combatants. Also, it is reasonable for us to understand Numbers 31 in a hyperbolic way. Three reasons are given. Reason one, first, Milgram notes several cases of obvious rhetorical exaggeration. The Israelite army is said to have killed every Midianite male in battle without a single Israelite fatality. Moreover, the spoil from the battle is said to be 32,000 maidens and 600 75,000 sheep and goats. And these numbers are astronomically and absurdly large. The second reason, understanding numbers 31 in a hyperbolic way was in line with ancient Near Eastern pattern of using hyperbolic numbers. And, and the third reason, when we turn to the book of Judges, if we take the narrative literally, it states quite emphatically that the Midianites were not wiped out at all. In Judges chapter 6 and 7, Midianites invade Israel in numbers said to be like swarms of locusts. As pointed out earlier, the book of Judges read like down to earth history. It is reasonable for us to take numbers in a hyperbolic way. So these are the reasons why, why it's reasonable for us to take numbers 31 in a hyperbolic way. Okay, so let's, um, let's move to another, uh, another case, the case of Amalekans, uh, Amalekites in the first of Samuel, okay? 
Now, the first of Samuel chapter 15, one to three says, Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people, Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Now, Wesley Morrison, a critic of Christian theism, raises two criticisms of the Old Testament God here. First, God commanded the genocide of the Amalekites. And the second criticism, God punished the Amalekites for what the ancestors did hundreds of years previously, and this is unjust. However, I believe that uh, these two criticisms are not cogent. They can be replied adequately. Okay, reply to Morriston's first criticism. Like other Hiram passages, we have good reasons for thinking that the aforementioned passage in, in, in the first of Samuel should be understood in a hyperbolic rather than a literal way. Here are the reasons. Reason one, in later chapters of the first of the first Samuel, we can see that the Amalekites were not literally wiped out. In, in, the, in first Samuel chapter 27, verses eight to nine, David invaded a territory full of Amalekites. And in First Chronicles chapter four, verse four to three, we can see that Amalekites were still there during the reign of Hezekiah. So if you view First Samuel and its canonical context as a single literary unit, the text cannot be sensibly claiming that First Samuel chapters 15 and 27 are both literally true accounts of battles with the Amalekites. The Sean and style of 1 Samuel chapter 15 shows that it contains hyperbole and exaggeration. For example, Saul's army was said to be 210,000 men, and this was larger than any army known at that time in antiquity. Also, the text said that Saul's battlefield extends from Havla to Shore, and this is an absurdly large battlefield. And the Heron language used is the same it's the same as that used hyperbolically in Georgia. So this is the second reason for thinking that the first of Samuel should be taken in a hyperbolic way. The third reason, the Haram language used in the first of Samuel chapter 15 is in line with the literary conventions of Congress accounts in ancient Near East. So uh, we, we have good reasons for thinking that uh, we should understand uh, the Haram language in God's command in a hyperbolic way rather than in a literal way. In other words, we have no reasons here for thinking that God commanded the genocides of the Amalekites. Okay, now let's uh, reply. Let's go to a reply to Morriston's second criticism. Okay, now, I believe that there's a plausible way other than Morristons to understand God's punishment in 1 Samuel chapter 15, one to three. Now let's uh, look at two passages first. The first passage comes from uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, okay? Now there it said, the one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. So here it shows that God opposes punishing the children for their parents' sins. But on the other hand, God says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, you shall not bow down to them, the idols, or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, there seems to be a tension between the above two passages. They seem to clash with each other. Can we resolve the, ten the tension? If so, how? 
I, I believe that there's a sensible way to resolve the apparent conflict. Now here's the way. A family's values and well will can easily transmit to later generations. This is why if parents are idols worshippers, the children, when they grow up, will also be idols worshippers. The culture of a society can easily transmit to later generations as well. So the Hindu culture in India transmits from generation to generation. And the human rights culture in the West also transmits from generation to generation. The above facts can help us understand Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. If the parents bow to idols, then probably the children will do so as well. God will punish the children for their own sins of idolatry, which are the same sins as those committed by the parents. Okay. So I, uh, I believe this is what the passage in Exodus 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 5 means. Okay. Now, of course, if the children repent and turn to God as Rahab and her family did, God will accept and not, not punish them. So in this way, we can we can reconcile Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, with Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. Now, I suggest that we can use the above way to understand God's punishment in the first Samuel chapter 15, 1 to 3. Now, according to the above suggested way to understand first Samuel chapter 15, 1 to 3, the, Amal the Amalekites were punished by God for their own sins rather than for their ancestors' sins, for other sins. But their sins were the same as their ancestors' sin. That is, idolatry, hostility towards attacks on and, and attempts to destroy the Israelites and other immoral practices. And the sins were the results of inferences from their ancestors. The malicious practices, the distorted values, and the hatred towards the Israelites were passed from one generation to another. And indeed, the first Samuel chapter, chapters 14 to 15 confirms the above interpretation of the text. For example, uh, 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 chapter 15, verse 18, it says, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites, which war against them until you have wiped them out. Now, the text mentioned Amalekite's present wickedness. Another passage, verse 33, but Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agai to death before the Lord at Gilgal. The text mentions Agai's present wickedness rather than his ancestors' sins. The third example, after Saul had assumed rule over Israel, he fought against the enemies on every side. Moab, the, Ammon, the, the Ammonites, Eden, the kings of Soba, and the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment on them. He fought voluntarily and defeated the Amalekites, delivering Israel from the hands of those who had plundered them. So the text again mentions Amalekites, present hostility to the Israelites rather than the ancestors' hostility. And uh, so uh, I think this way of understanding God's punishment in the first Samuel chapter 15, one to three has a lot of merits, okay? That is, as I understand it, uh, the passage says the Amalekites were punished for their own sins rather than the ancestors' sins. However, their present sins were the same as their parents. Okay, that is hostility towards the Israelites, attacks on the Israelites, uh, uh, and, and other uh, immoral practices uh, such as idolatry. Okay, now I think this way of, of understanding God's punishment in the first Samuel chapter 15, one to three has a lot of merits. It makes sense of the various biblical data and it can unify those data into a coherent whole. It is the most charitable way to interpret the relevant parts of the Old Testament. Now, because of the above considerations, there are good reasons for agreeing 
there are no good reasons, sorry, because of the, of the above considerations, there are no good reasons for agreeing with Morriston's second criticism. Now, how should God's command be understood? Now, if the Heron language should not be understood in a literal way, how then should it be understood? How then should God's command in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 16 to 18 be understood? Now, uh, consider God's words concerning his own command here. Now, the, uh, the text says, the scripture says, and when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them. Now, if, uh, if the Canaanites were totally destroyed, then of course, there is no need to mention. There is no need to issue warning against making treaty with them, right? Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods and the Lord's anger will burn, burn against you and will quickly destroy you. This is what you are to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherite popes and burn their idols in the fire. Now, Paul Coburn said, if the Canaanites were to be completely obliterated, why this discussion about intermarriage or treatises? The final verse emphasized that the ultimate issue was religious. Israel was to destroy orders, images, and sacred pillars. In other words, destroying Canaanite religion was more important than destroying Canaanite people. Kuban also said the Old Testament also uses the language of dispossessing the Canaanites of the land. And upon examination, the driving out references in the Old Testament are considerably more numerous than the destroying and, and annihilating ones. Now, an example uh, comes from Exodus uh, chapter 23, verses 27 to 30. And I, because of the limitations of time, I don't read it here. And you can read it yourself. Now, because of the above considerations, we can understand God's command as commanding the Israelite to do these things, okay, rather than uh, rather than exterminating the Canaanites, okay. God commanded the Israelites to, okay, to do the following things: first, have decisive victory over the Canaanites, okay. Second, drive out the Canaanites from the land. Third, purge the land of idolatry and other immoral practices. Fourth, not to make treaties with the Canaanites during the gradual process of driving, driving them out. And the last one, not to intermarry with the Canaanites during the gradual process of driving them out. So this is what God's command meant in Deuteronomy. Now understood in the above way, God's command had nothing to do with genocide at all. And God was more justified to, to drive the Canaanites out from the land because of the great wickedness. For example, child sacrifice, incest, speciality, homosexual acts, adultery, temple sex, and being extremely bloodthirsty themselves. So, uh, uh, so this is how we should understand the Hiram language within God's command to the Israelites. Okay, understanding it in a hyperbolic way. And, and we have good reasons to understand the Hebrew language in those passages in a hyperbolic way, rather than a literal way, okay? Okay, now, uh, uh, okay, uh, the time is not much, uh, it's running out, so uh, let me be quick. Reply to possible objection. The first possible objection comes from Trimper, Trimper Lawman the third. He said, I agree with Paul Copen that the battle reports of the conquest, including that of Jericho, are rich with hyperbole in keeping with the battle reports of the day. I also agree that the popular imagination has magnified the size of cities like Jericho, and that it is possible that Jericho could have been mainly a military outpost with few non-combatants at that time. But there were non-combatants there, like Rahab and her family. Granted, Rahab was the type of woman, a prostitute, who would accompany soldiers to the front line, but she was still a non combatant and so was, we can safely assume, at least part of her family. It is doubtful that she was the only woman present. And Lawman said, minimizing the ethical problems, even as much as Coben does, 
does not remove the offense to many modern people. If even one non-combatant or one child dies, then the criticisms and controversy do not go away. In reply, okay. I, I would raise these questions to, uh, to Loman. Okay, how does Loman know that besides Rahab and her family, there were other non-combatants in Jericho when Jericho was attacked by the Israelites? It is not surprising that Rahab and her family were the only non-combatants in Jericho when it was under the attack by the Israelites. Now, this is my reason for my claim. According to the findings of archaeology, Jericho and I were military strongholds. In fact, Jericho gathered the travel routes from the Jordan Valley up to population centers in the hill country. It was the first line of defense at the junction of three roads leading to Jerusalem, Bethel, and Opa. That means that if Israel's wars here were directed toward government and military installments rather than population centers, Jericho was a small settlement of probably 100 or fewer soldiers. Okay, this is what archaeology tells us. Now, if Jericho was a military outpost, having only 100 or fewer soldiers, it was not surprising that Rahab's hostel was the only hostel there. And the non-combatants in Jericho were very few. And that all of the non-combatants except Rahab and her family had fled the city before it was attacked by the Israelites. Okay, when, when they heard that the Israelites uh, were coming to attack the city, those very few non-combatants went away, fled, they fled. This is entirely possible, right? So there are good, there are no good reasons. Now, this is what I want to what I want to claim, okay? So uh, there are no good reasons for thinking that besides Rahab and her family, there were other non-combatants there during the battle. Accordingly, there are no good reasons for thinking that the Old Testament God commanded the killing of non-combatants in the Battle of Jericho. Since the critics of Christian theism, for example, Morriston, charge that the Old Testament God commanded genocide, and the killing of Canaanite non-combatants, the burden of proof is on the critics to show that their charge is true. To rebut their charge, the Christian theist just needs to point out that the critics' charge is ungrounded. So I, I, I'm doing just this, and I'm saying that there are no good reasons for thinking that there are other non-combatants in the city besides Rahab and her family during the Battle of Jericho. Now, the second possible objection, okay. Now, Coburn and Flanagan argue that the Hiram language used in the conquest accounts should be understood in a hyperbolic way. However, Tremper Lomond, the third, challenges their view. Coburn wants to believe that this language, that is the Hiram language too, is stereotypical. But if so, then, that makes no sense of the contrast between waging war with people outside the land where harem is not applied. In this type of warfare, only the men are executed. Okay, that is warfare outside the promised land. Okay, only men are executed. The women and children are not. Okay, so, so uh, if the harem language is not to be understood in a lateral way, how could we make sense of the contrast between waging war within the promised land and waging war outside the promised land. Now, uh, here is my reply. Even if the Hiram language is to be understood as hyperbolic and God's command is to be understood in my suggested way, we can still make a lot of sense of the contrast between waging war with the Canaanites on the promised land and waging war with peoples outside the promised land. After waging war with peoples outside the promised land, if the Israelites would only bring back the plunders from those peoples and they would not, that is the Israelites would not live on their land, would not live on those lands. So they did not need to drive those peoples out from their original land or purge the land of their religious practices. But for the wars on the promised land, the situation was quite different. God commanded the Israelites to drive away the peoples originally living on the promised land and destroy completely their religious practice on the promised land so that the Israelites could live on the promised land as God's holy people separated from other peoples. Hence, 
hence uh, allotments objection to the hyperbolic reading defense fails to be cogent. And here, uh, Dominic, uh, may, may I have uh, five more minutes to finish uh, my reply to the third possible objection? Yes, yes, Doc. Okay. Okay, the third possible objection comes from Morrison. He said, but even if the biblical writers were indulging in hyperbole, the fact remains that as he is depicted in these stories, God commands that a lot of killing be done and that he wants this killing to include the slaughter of many non-combatants. On any plausible interpretation, God is commanding crimes against humanity and it would, and it would have been wrong for the Israelites to obey. But why should we agree with Morriston that the fact remains that God commands that a lot of killing to be done and he wants this killing to include the slaughter of many non combatants What is Morriston's evidence for his claim? Now, this is his, his uh, uh, first argument for his claim. Okay, the argument has, has two premises and one conclusion. Premise A, okay, Morriston's argument, premise A, if God's command to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15 to attack the, Am the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them was hyperbolic in meaning, then Saul would not be rejected by God for disobeying God's command. B, Saul was rejected by God for disobeying God's command. Therefore, God's command to Saul was not hyperbolic, but literal in meaning. Okay, now if statement C, if the conclusion of Morrison's argument is true, then God would want the killing to include the slaughter of many non combatants However, I think this argument is not a good argument because premise A is questionable. Okay, now as pointed out by Copen and Flanagan, even if God's command was hyperbolic in meaning, Saul's actions would still violate God's command since Saul spared the best sheep of the Amalekites and did not destroy the livestock in accordance with God's command. So the hyperbolic reading uh, can explain well why Saul was rejected by God. Okay, now Morriston's second argument is like this. Okay, premise A. God commanded the Israelites to literally exterminate the Canaanites on the promised land, but the Israelites disobeyed God's command. This can explain why Israelites fell into the situation which God did not want to see, that is intermarrying with other peoples and joining the idolatry. Therefore, God commanded the Israelites to literally exterminate the Canaanites on the promised land. Now, I think this argument is flawed as well because the conclusion does not follow from the premise. Okay. Why, why does the conclusion not follow from the, from the premise? My reason is this. It is entirely possible that there are either hypotheses which can explain equally well the fact that Israelites fell into the situation God did not want to see that is intermarrying with other peoples and join in their idolatry. One such hypothesis is that God did not command the Israelites to exterminate the Canaanites on the promised land, but just to drive them out from the promised land and that the Israelites disobey God's command. Now, if the Israelites obey God's command and drove all the Canaanites out from the promised land, then they would not fall into the aforementioned undesirable situation. So this hypothesis can explain equally well why the Israelites fell into the undesirable situation. And as pointed out by Copen and Flanagan, this hypothesis is even supported by Judges chapter one. Now, since the conclusion of Morriston's second argument does not follow from his premise, Morriston's second argument for his claim fails. Because of the above considerations, there are no good reasons for agreeing with Morrison's claim that the fact remains that God demands that a lot of killing be done, and he wants this killing to include the slaughter of many non-combatants. Hence, the third possible objection to the hyperbolic reading defense is not a cogent objection. Now, this is my conclusion. 
Now, the critics of Christian theism, such as uh, Morriston, provides the genocide argument. The, the premise of it says the Old Testament God commanded the genocide of the Canaanites. The conclusion of it says the Old Testament God is not perfectly good. Now, I have argued above that there are good reasons for doubting the truth of premise one. Therefore, the genocide argument fails to be cogent. So um, this is uh, my conclusion and the, end, and the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chan. And Dr. Chan has brought uh, both the argument very, very efficiently. We have seen all the slides in very detail. In fact, there was one question here from 1 Samuel 15.3, go attack the Amalekites, kill all of them. If this is hyperbolic, why was Saul rejected or condemned later on? And Dr. Chan has already answered that in the slides. Uh, but if Karthik has a follow-up question on that, you can still ask. We can take uh, one or two questions to fit in the time. Yeah. Or anyone else has a question? This was a, a big topic in the last conference. So I'm grateful to Dr. Chen to, to do it, it on this topic. You're welcome. Any questions? Anyone has a question? While it appears to me that uh, Dr. Chan pulled out all the possible objections as and has already countered them, so <laughs> it's difficult to. But if anyone has a question, if no, we can we can end this conference. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining it. Thank Those you very much. The ideas and. Great thanks to Professor Kwan, Dr. Lok, Dr. Chan for the presentations and all uh, three or four uh, various Bible colleges being represented by uh, different, pe different people here. So uh, a number of them watching on Facebook as well and the video will also be uploaded to YouTube for the benefit of all. So thank you very much. Uh, one part of the question, how, how far hyperbolic interpretation is valid in a historical narrative? Well, if uh, Dr. Chan would like to shed some light and then... Okay, we'll... uh, okay. Uh, uh, I think uh, um, uh, as in my PowerPoint, uh, um, when I suggest that some passages are to be interpreted in a hyperbolic, hyper, hyperbolic way, uh, um, uh, we, uh, I provide reasons uh, why they should be so taken. Uh, for example, uh, the first one, if you don't take uh, those passages in a hyperbolic way, then there will be um, inconsistencies between uh, uh, different passages, even in the same book. Okay, and, and this is difficult to explain because uh, the writer, the author, or the editor, they, they were not stupid people, right? Uh, uh, they should be. They could easily see uh, the, uh, the the conflicts, the, the inconsistencies between the different accounts. So why should they deliberately put together two inconsistent accounts? This is difficult to explain. And I think we should interpret uh, passages in a charitable way. Okay, we should not assume that the authors were stupid. Right. Right. So this is one reason why we should take those passages in a hyperbolic way. Uh, otherwise, we, we can hardly explain, the, explain why the author was, uh, um, uh, was so minus that uh, uh, he deliberately put two inconsistent accounts together in the same book or in, in, um, uh, between two books, such as Joshua and Judges. The second reason is that uh, this interpretation coheres well with, um, with the literary convention at that time, okay, in the near um, ancient East. Okay, from archaeology, 
uh, historians tell us that uh, uh, tell us that the literary convention of conquest accounts at that time exactly use hyperbole. Okay, so uh, uh, as uh, as uh, the author of Deuteronomy and and Joshua wrote their books within the context within the cultural context of their time, so we have reason for thinking that they are uh, they were influenced or if they even follow uh, the literary convention of their time in writing their conquest accounts. However, if there are no such reasons, if uh, uh, when we are confronting with a given passage in the Bible, and if we have no reasons to take it in a long lit literal way, then we are, it would not be legitimate for us to take those passages uh, as hyperbolic rather than literal. But in the case of Heron language, we have good reasons to take them as hyperbolic. Okay, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Karthik uh, continues to ask if hyperbolic interpretation is a shortcut to avoid inconsistencies, especially in a historical narrative. Um, um, right. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is a good way and a charitable way to interpret authors, right? I think uh, if there are different interpretations available, then others being equal, we should adopt the most charitable interpretation, right? And I believe that hyperbolic interpretation here uh, uh, is the most charitable one when we interpret uh, Deuteronomy and Joshua. Uh, uh, um, uh, since uh, this interpretation can resolve the inconsistencies okay, uh, um, among the, the different passages. So my point is this, um, um, the hyperbolic reading of Joshua and Deuteronomy and other Hiram passages, okay, can, um, can make um, the relevant parts of, a, of the Old Testament into a coherent way, okay, um, so that they would not clash with each other. And this is the most charitable way to, to read an author, uh, unless there are, uh, there are reasons against taking these passages hyperbolically, I think we should adopt the most charitable way to understand um, the Old Testament passages. And secondly, and secondly, indeed, I, I would like to make clear that my task in my presentation is modest. I just want to show that um, the premise of the genocide argument is ungrounded. That is, we have no reason for um, for thinking that God commanded the genocides of the Canaanites. And that premise is based on a literal reading. And here I just want to point out that we have good reasons to doubt a literal interpretation. Okay. And, and this is already sufficient for us um, to, to point out that the premise of the genocide argument is doubtful. I, I hope that I can make myself clear. So my task is very modest. I just want to point out by providing reasons why the premise of the genocide argument is questionable and we have no good reasons for believing that it is true. Okay, I think I do not have a burden to prove that it is false. I just need to point out that um, uh, uh, we have no reason for thinking that it is true and this is already sufficient to um, to, to dismantle the genocide argument. And my task in this in interpretation is just to dismantle the genocide argument. Thank you, Dr. Chen, for, for the answer. Uh, so I think it's time we can uh, end this conference. And thanks to all participants and presenters. May I call on uh, Reverend Jayanth uh, from the Vice Principal of Central Seminary to say some concluding words and a concluding prayer. Thank you.
Hello. Asa kayo din? Sir, can you hear me, Dr. Dolby? Yes, yes, can hear. Thank you. Uh, sir, Reverend Jeffrey has gone somewhere for work. Can you, can you do that, Reverend Nickel? Uh, we are joining uh, this conference from India, the RC Central India Technological Seminary, with our faculty and staff, you can see the webcam. We are thankful to Dr. Dolby, especially to Dr. Uh, Law and Dr. Chan and Professor Khan. Uh, for their wonderful sessions on the theology and the problem of evil and many other pertinent issues that we believe that our students are blessed because they had a lot of questions pertaining to the same topics because they've been asking in the classes uh, and especially I'm thankful to uh, Dr. Dabu for arranging this uh, platform to join with all the uh, world calls and uh, scholars and listen to them. So we are thankful once again to uh, all the people who contributed to the arranging of this conference. And here, we would like to pray and conclude this session. Loving Father, we are thankful to you for this beautiful afternoon, Lord. You have been blessing us with the many teachings of your word and from the scholars across the world, Lord. We are thankful to you for this conference of Christian apologetics. And we will be uh, able to understand many of things from your word of Lord, the tough passages and questions that comes to us from the believer and non-believer alike, oh Lord. We are thankful to you for being the scholars and helping us understand the tough uh, issues of your word of Lord. Indeed, your word is so deep and so marvelous, and it's a blessing for us, oh Lord, to be a part of this conference. We pray for Dr. Dominic and all the scholars of Lord. Let them continue to be a blessing for many in the days to come. Let there be many conferences like this, Lord, in the days to come, and it will be a blessing for the people who are struggling with the questions of your word and Christian faith. I pray, O oh God, as uh, uh, many other uh, friends have joined from the different parts of this world in India, you bless all of them, O oh Lord. There are still many questions, and we believe, O oh Lord, in the days to come, again, we will be able to join together and have this conference again. Once again, bless us together. Jesus, amen. Amen. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Chairman Dr. Lok. <laughs> thank you for everything. And so, thank you. Bye to all. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye to God all. Bless. Thank you.